everyone. <clears throat> Thanks, Josh. Um, uh, really, really pleased to to be with everyone here today. Um, unfortunately, uh, you know, I wish it was uh, <clears throat> under better circumstances. So, you know, everybody's uh, you go, going through these uh, these fun times these days. And originally, this was uh, um, a workshop scheduled for the um, first conference last year in Montreal. Um, but uh, you know, I've I've been with uh, with First for a while. Um, and, and I've spoken in a number of their events and uh, hopefully looking forward to some in-person events where I get to catch up with everybody because uh, I, I do find that uh, there's some of the best events out there are being run by FIRST. So, um, so yeah, so today we're going to be doing uh, an introduction to SISMON. So obviously, I mean, we can talk about SISMON in, in uh, less than whatever it is, three hours, four hours. So, um, I do talk a lot about Sysmon, but I'm also going to introduce a lot of other things that kind of lead us into how we're going to use Sysmon um, from from a logging perspective. So there's a lot of uh, there's there's some intro stuff to um, to kind of how we how we lead up to using Sysmon. Uh, and as Josh mentioned, if there's any questions, like feel free to ask them. I'm I'm going to check the um, the questions. Uh, the, the QA pane every so often to see if there's any questions. And uh, if I don't answer them right away, it's because I haven't checked, but we, we will get through all of your questions, um, you know, before the end of the session. So, um, so just a bit about me. Um, again, my name is Peter Morn. I'm uh, currently the um, cybersecurity practice lead for Grand Thornton, Canada. Um, so let me hide this thing here. Uh, so I'm, I'm based out of Halifax, Nova Scotia on the east coast of Canada. I've uh, been uh, working in cybersecurity uh, on and off uh, for probably the last uh, 25 years and um, um, primarily focused on cyber for about probably the last 20 or 15 to 20 years. Um, my, my specialization is in uh, critical infrastructure. Um, so I do a lot of work with uh, power companies, uh, water utilities, uh, that kind of thing. Um, and uh, frequent speaker um, at a lot of different conferences. So uh, I may have I may have met some of you before at a conference uh, in the past. So so uh, quick disclaimer, uh, you know I'm I'm not a lawyer uh, and I don't pretend to be one. So uh, at the end of the day, uh, my views and opinions expressed in this presentation are mine and don't reflect in any way those of my employer. Uh, I, uh, we will be talking about obviously Sysmon and some other things. I don't specifically endorse a product over another. Uh, I use products that just tend to work. Um, so we are going to show, I'm going to show you some Splunk in this as well. I'm not saying Splunk is the best SIM product out there. It just happens to be what I'm using. Um, and I obviously, uh, we're going to talk about deployments and things like that. Um, so obviously you know, don't go out starting deploying Sysmon into your production environment, um, you know, without, you know, proper planning for that. Um, and then obviously ensuring you're, you're including uh, your internal IT people, your vendors, and so on and so forth. So what are we going to talk about? Well, we're going to talk about, uh, so obviously we're going to talk about Sysmon. Um, but first I want to kind of talk about some things leading up to Sysmon. So, uh, we'll talk a bit about state of cyber defense, um, and and that's going to kind of give us an indication of why um, why logging and specifically the use of Sysmon is is kind of key here. Um, we're going to talk about what why we would want to log and what we should log. Um, if for those of you who are not familiar with the attack framework, we're going to talk about that a little bit. And the reason I want to talk about attack is really because. Uh, what we're trying to do in our logs is not necessarily focus on indicators of compromise, so IPs, URLs, and that. What we're trying to do is use logging to really focus on TTPs. So uh, put more focus on identifying uh, behaviors in our systems through through Sysmon logging. So that's why I'm going to talk about attack framework. It's not going to be a huge, huge section, but we are going to talk about it. Um, I'm going to talk about what I could call the endpoint problem. So uh, we will talk about why Sysmon is a critical component to your um, endpoint solution. Uh, we'll, in, we'll look at installing and configuring Sysmon. Um, we'll talk about integration of Sysmon into your SIM. 
Um, and then we're going to go through a whole section on use cases. So, uh, and within those use cases, I actually use some some uh, case studies. So, some some actual attacks that have happened, and uh, where Sysmon may have may have been a um, a tool that could have helped in. Uh, I don't want to say preventing, but early containment, early or early detection. So, uh, state of cyber defense. So. You know, today, I mean, and and this isn't a hundred percent everybody. I mean, I've I've I work with companies all all the time, and some are doing better than others, um, but very very still a very traditional defensive posture. Um, so uh, you know, I'm still not seeing a lot of a lot of organizations that are going down the road of of threat hunting, for example. Um, a lot of that is because I mean, we are still going through a cyber skill shortage. So we still have to worry about the issue of not having enough people to actually do what we need to do. Um, and, you know, through, through obviously through the pandemic that has uh, had an effect on how we staff and what we're actually doing. I don't know how many companies I've worked with that have turned around and said, well, look, I have to put all these projects on hold because I have to deal with remote access or I have to deal with, um, you know, uh, escalating my, my pro project to move things to the cloud to enable my remote workforce. So lots of things are contributing to this, but essentially, you know, we're still working to maintain that strong perimeter. So, you know, the, the firewall is still an important piece of it. Um, you know, the the whole onion, um, the, the whole thought of the onion is still there for layered security. Um, we're focused a lot on, IO, on um, indicators of compromise, so IOCs. So when you look at all these different threat feeds, uh, we still focus a lot on, you know, blocking IPs from certain bad actors or uh, URLs or, you know, we work around hashes and, and things that, you know, that we can consume, apply to our SIM and search for. Uh, we focus on policies to discourage their misuse or insider threat. Uh, we still, you know, even though um, there are a lot of new technologies such as EDR and MDR out there, um, you know, there's still a lot of people that are focusing on basic endpoint security. So I still go into companies that are running basic McAfee or signature-based um, antivirus tools as their sole endpoint security product. Um, and then, like I said, there are some technologies out there. You know, there's EDR, CASB. There's some people are implementing UEBA to, to start to look at behavior. Um, so, you know, but it's still very, very traditional from, from what I'm seeing. That predictability really makes us vulnerable. So the, the same way I can figure out kind of what my clients are doing, well, the attackers obviously have that information as well. So, you know, breaches are still involving a lot of malware, uh, human-based attacks, so a lot of phishing and um, social engineering, that kind of thing. Uh, you know, we look at most of the most of the attacks that are occurring, and it's still, you know, oh, person got an email with a, you know, uh, a a file from HR, they opened it up and, you know, some remote access tool got downloaded or they got hit with ransomware. So that's still very, very big popular way of getting into, an, uh, you know, an environment. Um, you know, we still see in many cases, we, we it's still in many cases uh, assume breach is going to come through the front door. Um, so we, we monitor our firewalls and we, we say to ourselves, you know, um, Hey, look, you know, I'm, I'm getting port scan. That must be an attack. I, I recently went to work with a company and uh, we were doing um, an assessment of their SOC because they wanted to kind of go to SOC 2.0. And I sat with the analysts and the analysts said to me, uh, you know, look, hey, we're getting all these, uh, we're getting all this port scanning activity from, I don't know, some IP in, in China or Russia or whatever it may be. And uh, they said, well, you know, so we're gonna we're gonna actually take some time and look at that. So, I said, okay, well, what are you gonna do with it? Well, we're gonna we're gonna make sure that uh, we're gonna we're gonna open a ticket and send it to tier two. And I said, well, are those IPs bypassing bypassing your firewall? And they said, no. And I said, well, why are you focused on that? Your firewall is doing what it's supposed to do, and you're gonna just basically, you know, start to look at IPs that are gonna change. Um, you know, in the next couple hours. So, you know, there's that, that front door defense is still in place. Uh, we're focused on this very much a castle defense. 
and uh, you know we throw a lot of te technology at a problem, uh, but we're still struggling on the opex side. So, you know, we don't necessarily have enough people to do the work all the time, um, and uh, in many cases. Um, the organizations just don't want to spend on having a large dedicated security team. Um, increasing per permeable perimeters, exploiting our trust. So our borders that have been well-defined have become very porous. Uh, we've, we've found this more and more with the pandemic, obviously. So things like shadow IT, I mean, again, working with organizations that just need to get business done. So they're a little bit more lax on, you know, allowing end users to use uh, non-sanctioned cloud applications. Uh, a lot of traffic moving in and out of the network now. Um, and uh, the enterprise and attackers both use tools um, um, to, to ensure encryption is in place. So all these things make it even harder to, uh, to really secure our, our networks. A uh, lot of no, well-known organizations are breached. So, you know, I'd like to say that it's all these little organizations that nobody knows that are being breached. But when you look at it, I mean, these are fairly large organizations. They're organizations that have dedicated security departments. They're organizations that have multi-million dollar budgets for security and still they're being breached. So, um, you know, that, that says a lot for, you know, that, you know, the fact that there's still problem areas that have to be solved at the end of the day. So what, is, what, what has gone wrong at the end of the day here? Well, in many cases, the organizations that we just saw had incident response teams in place. Uh, in many cases, they had detection tools that were working as designed. Um, and the interesting thing is that a lot of these organizations uh, only discover breaches uh, through, their, through their own monitoring uh, in, in only about 31% of the cases. So that means that the monitoring systems that are in place, um, although might be um, best in class, uh, maybe not baselined or set up properly. Uh, maybe they don't have the staff to really uh, ensure that they can actually have some eyes on glass. Uh, because like I said, uh, in a lot of in most cases, what we're seeing is third parties are approaching these organizations um, such as law enforcement and basically saying, hey, you know what? We have uh, intelligence to prove that you've been breached or they're seeing things like uh, other organizations that are contacting them saying, look, look I've got, I'm getting a lot of uh, traffic coming from your network that doesn't seem legitimate. You might wanna check your equipment to make sure that nothing's gotten into your network. Um, so we have to improve that. We have to improve the fact that you know, and I always tell people in this day and age, we, we have to start assuming breach, right? Because it's going to happen. We just have to be better prepared for it. Um, the concept of obviously the concept of dwell time is still there. It's, it's, it's uh, getting slightly better, but it's not still where we need it to be. Um, you know, Home Depot, which, which was a, a breach that happened uh, a number of years ago, it was five months. Um, so you could see the, uh, the, the 200 day average is still pretty high. Um, SOC reliance on endpoint detection response and SIM has resulted in general lack of east-west vis visibility or visibility and communications across the network. Um, and, and so, you know, we're not necessarily prepared for um, attackers getting in our network and uh, performing any lateral movement on our network. Um, we're more prepared for them trying to breach the front door. Um, and this has obviously caused a lot of SOC fatigue. So at the end of the day, you know, again, just an indication that we have to kind of change the way we do things. So as I mentioned, uh, we have to take more of a stance on active defense. So we have to assume breach. Um, we have to uh, basically use use of limited offensive um, action and counterattacks, and obviously try to deny that contested area or position to the enemy, which we try to avoid them basically building a beachhead in our network, um, even if we're prepared for them to get into our network. Um, you know, it's funny because we're all focused a lot on on the when we look at our incident response process, we're also focused on you know that the detection piece. Um, and, and I say, I sit a lot of my clients and I focus on that containment piece. Like once that breach occurs, 
once that ransomware is on your network, what are you doing to contain the, the bleeding, right? What are you doing to make that stop um, as opposed to, you know, uh, being so focused on the response piece of it, right? Um, those advanced threats are obviously hard to find, very human directed, as we mentioned, goal oriented, uh, dynamic, they adjust to change, very highly coordinated, well funded, uh, a lot of them multiple tools and activities. And, and obviously, we're seeing a lot of ever changing evasion tactics. A lot of the reasons why we're going to talk about attack, for example, in a little bit. So uh, as I mentioned before, uh, a lot of the focus needs to be on this detection of lateral movement. So uh, again, not to say that we shouldn't focus at all on breach uh, or, or, or breach of our controls and in, in getting into the network, but really what we want to do is, is put, some put a little bit more focus on detection of lateral movement. Uh, the initial breach normally doesn't yield value to an attacker. So if we look at the typical attack pattern and we look at things like phishing, it's a lot of economy of scale, right? So at the end of the day, if if we are focused, the attacker's not necessarily focused on that breach. They're basically, like I said, going at scale. The important part of the attack for the, uh, for the, the attacker is that hands-on keyboard. And that's where uh, a good percentage of their funds are spent. It's when they actually have, um, um, an attacker on a keyboard actually um, making it making their way through your network. So 80% of the attack is typically spent uh, during lateral movement. Uh, the interesting thing is at that point, the attacker is really moving blindly through, the, through their network. You know more about your network or you should know more about your network than they do. Um, and that's your biggest win. That's the biggest opportunity to corner them in your network um, and be able to uh, be able to identify them and potentially get some attribution information out of that as well. So the typical lateral movements that we see, um, you know, and the goal is to obviously stay under under the radar. Um, attackers are going to use very legitimate sysadmin tools. Um, so you know whether they're using um, inherent vulnerabilities like pass the hash. So if they're if they're really trying to use some things that are inherent in, in Windows, um, if they're doing things like scanning uh, SMB scanning, we saw that with the Sony attack years ago, uh, where you know a lot of the uh, a lot of the recon that was done internally on the network was to steal files that contained passwords, um, and then like a lot like I said, a lot of uh, tools that we're typically going to use from a system in perspective, uh, whether it's PowerShell scripts. Uh, to um, to basically connect to systems remotely or to control systems locally. Um, Sys internals tools like PS exec. Uh, I see PS exec all the time in incidents. Uh, it's always it's there it's there to um, to uh, move files onto a victim system and it's there to ex execute those files remotely. Um, things like uh, Windows management instrumentation so, WMI, um, as well as the use of RDP and, and other weaker forms of access such as VNC. So all these things are there and because they're being used by, uh, they're typically being used by uh, people in the environment, they tend, to, they tend to stay off the radar or it's harder to identify when some of this stuff is being used uh, for you know, non-legitimate purposes. So when we talk about Sysmon in a little bit, a lot of our focus is going to be on, okay, well, if this stuff is legitimately used on my network, how do I create use cases to identify when it's not being used legitimately, right? So and there's, there's obviously ways of doing that. And you can see here that all the things I'm listing here, they all affect the, uh, the endpoint. Like there's, you know, at the end of the day, you could have some great network-based tools, firewalls, that kind of thing. But realistically, all of these methods, they all affect the endpoint at the end of the day. So can we win in this weird kind of environment? Yes, um, we, we, but it's all about obviously reducing that attack dwell time and, and being a little bit more proactive versus reactive. So uh, adapting to really basically put some effort on logging at the endpoint um, and and base and using the, that data to really create some really good use cases 
to detect things that just aren't normal in the network. I'm just gonna check to see if we have any questions. Uh, I think we're good. So anyway, if anybody questions, I'm gonna check the questions panel every so often. Uh, you know, I don't like, don't wait till the end because you know, what I wanna do is, is I know we're all muted, but start some discussion if we, if we can about the things that we're talking about. Um, and I don't want to get to the end and then you're starting to ask questions about stuff from the beginning. It's it's not fair to you guys. So ask questions as we go along. I'm going to be checking that panel every so often. Perfect. All right. So uh, really good. Uh, Matt, Matt Graber had a really good uh, a post on Twitter back in 2018. He says here, incident responder says the machine was infected with crime where we just had IT rebuild the system. End of story. Nation state attacker. We got our foothold and only lost a single host in the process. So visibility over the breach is critical. Like, you know, the minute that you wipe that system, obviously, we all know if we've ever done forensics, the minute you wipe that fist system, you're losing all the really good valuable bits, right? Um, so you know, we'll, we'll learn that again, a lot of this is focused on the endpoint and what we can do at the endpoint, right? So where are these targeted attacks best detected? As I mentioned, what where we're looking at and where you see that, that sweet spot is really around um, that escalation privileges and lateral movement in the network. Um, that is gonna create the largest amount of forensic footprint. Um, and again, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of what we see is the attacker is is focused really on hands on keyboard during that that point in time. So uh, we have to start to recognize the goals no longer to respond and stop threats, but also to find the adversaries that are already in the network. So really focusing on that 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 spot where the privilege escalation is happening, internal reconnaissance, lateral movement, and uh, and uh, further presence that is the sweet spot that we want to look for. Uh, question in regards to ransomware, do we know where we can find more information to implement an effective policy? I'll, I'll save that one, uh, Philippe, till the end and I can, I can uh, provide some information on that one at the end. So for example, for hunting for malicious use of PowerShell um, and we look at uh, the command line arguments, parent relationships, and so on, we can use the, their experience to differentiate from legitimate admin activity. So things like, you know, uh, the use of encoded commands, right? Like if you're if you're a sysadmin on a network and you're using PowerShell on the network, uh, is there a reason to use an encoded command? Uh, you know, that's a thought, right? The other thing is, are if you're using like PowerShell to download something from a, an internet website, um, so those two things alone, but also the fact that they're actually being executed from uh, a, a, like a Word document, like these are things we want to look for, but directly might be a little bit hard to identify because, for example, we allow PowerShell on the network. So those are things we want to really look for um, because they are going to help us identify things that are out of the norm uh, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, things that are occurring on the network. So why is this detection so difficult? Um, again, targeted intrusions often begin with opportunistic compromises. Uh, attackers can be erratic and unpredictable when operating in an unfamiliar environment. Uh, that is alone, that one alone is makes it really difficult for us to build um, a set of uh, typical use cases if uh, an attacker is doing things and he's not, you know, this is why we kind of have to step away from just following process because the attacker may not specific, specifically be following any, any real process at the end of the day. Um, in many cases, our, our evidence is incomplete or insufficient to really uh, prove that somebody is actually in the network. Um, and that kind of leads me to uh, the pyramid of pain. Um, and you guys may have seen Dave Bianco. Um, uh, he speaks at a lot of first events, uh, super good guy if you ever have a chance definitely uh, connect with him after one of his talks when we're back in person. 
uh, really, really great guy, super, super uh, smart guy. Uh, he developed this concept of the pyramid of pain. Um, and really what it is, is it's uh, uh, basically the, what I call the potential usefulness of Intel. So if you look at it, uh, we have some typical um, uh, indicators of compromise. So, and, and some typical data that we've seen in the past. So like, for example, hash values coming from uh, legacy AV, uh, those are kind of trivial to get. Um, IP addresses, domain names, uh, you know, that kind of thing we're getting from uh, uh, indicators of compromise, um, you know, uh, network host artifacts, tools. When we get to the, the TTPs, this is where we be basically uh, the hardest information to get, um, you know, uh, the, the hardest to detect and the most useful. So that's where, you know, hunting is going to really fill that void at the end of the day. And, and, and like I said, when we talk about the attack framework, really that the attack framework is really focused on the use of TTPs in our environment. So, uh, you know, our incidents are very nonlinear as well. Again, all these things that are making it really difficult to be able to detect and hunt out uh, the adversary in our networks at any given time. Uh, a lot of moving parts to understand and collect data from uh, can create a challenge. So a large number of unique PE files. So if you're not familiar with a portable uh, uh, PE file, it's essentially a Windows uh, file type for executables, DLLs, drivers. So we have a large amount of these unique PE files uh, that are executed uh, or loaded on a number of servers and endpoints. We have different OS versions to, uh, to deal with, um, user installed applications, uh, random GUID file names and paths, temporary artifacts, the effect of updates and patches that are changing our environments at any given time. I like to say it's like looking for a needle in a stack of needles at the end of the day. So that leads me to the uh, MITRE attack framework. So well, let's talk about the attack framework in a little bit and uh, basically see how, how it can, uh, you know, how it can affect the way we do uh, the use of Syspot in, the, in, in, their, in our environments at the end of the day. Oop. So for those of you not familiar with the attack framework, um, it stands for the Adversarial Tactics, Techniques, and Common Knowledge. Um, it is a, quote, curated knowledge base and model for cyber ad adversary ad behavior. Uh, it consists of 11 tactics from initial access execution all the way through command and control and data exfiltration. Um, and each phase of the attack lifecycle um, consists of a multitude of techniques that have been observed in the wild. Uh, we have a question, I believe, or a hand raised. Okay, it's just about whether the uh, will it be be possible to access the recording and slides later. Absolutely. Um, so the great thing about the attack framework is MITRE um, they they update this on a regular basis. I think, if I recall, I think it's every quarter. It might be it might be more uh, more more sooner now. But essentially, the great thing about this is they they gather uh, intel from various areas. So they may go to, for example, Microsoft or, or what have you. They may go to different sources for Intel. And essentially what they do is they update their, the attack framework with this information on a regular basis. So the great thing is the attack framework um, it's, is actually based on like real world situations. So uh, real world behaviors. Um, so for example, if you have a, an attacker that is well known that, that does you know, 10 different things consistently when they're attacking a network, well, the MITRE attack framework takes into account those 10 things and basically, you know, provides the details. So when you're building use cases, you're now building use cases around those 10 different behaviors that uh, the attacker, um, you know, would be known to use. And, and MITRE, the attack framework can be used kind of two ways. It can be used to detect specific campaigns 
So for example, you know, if you're, if, if, if uh, you think you've been attacked by um, a specific attack group uh, related to a specific campaign, or if you basically are just looking for typical behaviors that an attacker might use um, in your environment, that's what it, what the attack framework is, has been able to do. They also have a, an ICS version uh, for industrial control systems. So you can apply this to uh, a non-enterprise environment. If you have things like PLCs and, and other ICS components, you can actually apply that to, to, uh, to the MITRE ATT&CK ICS version. So uh, why is attack important? Well, uh, as adversaries get more skilled, um, defenders have to be up on their game as well. Uh, by, dis by classifying the attacks into discrete units as MITRE does, um, it's easier for researchers to see common patterns. And, and I'll show you that when we look at MITRE. Uh, it's, easy, it's, uh, it's easier to figure out who authored different campaigns and track how an attack method has evolved over the years. So the great thing is we've noticed things like um, the use of remote access tools or malware. Uh, what we've been able to see with MITRE, for example, is uh, an initial attack by a specific attack group using a specific kind of uh, malware. Then basically people have built in all kinds of defense and detection against that piece of malware. So that attack group will then focus on uh, removing that piece of malware and replacing it with some other uh, some other attack method. And then essentially what happens is MITRE will pick up on that and they'll update the attack framework. So you get to see how the, the, the attacker has kind of evolved from using one tool, gone through the process of, well, everybody knows that they're going to use that tool. So you build, they build detection routines all the way to while well, the the uh, the attack group has changed their method, so now they have a different way of getting into the environment. So, a lot of people ask me, "Well, we have a, if we are using attack, what about the 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 good old cyber kill chain?" Well, the the cyber kill chain is the attack framework is not just another kill chain system. So when you look at when you look at the Lockheed Martin kill chain. Um, it's really much focused on a on a step by step process. So when you look at the kill chain, it's like okay, well, the attacker is going to perform some kind of reconnaissance. They're going to weaponize a file. They're going to deliver it, and then what we typically do is we we apply uh, indicators of compromise to these various steps in the kill chain. So we know, for example, uh, once they weaponize a file, we may have a whole bunch of um, of uh, hash file, hashes related to that weaponized file. Um, you know, when they deliver it, we might have um, email addresses um, of, known, uh, of known phishing campaigns. Um, when they set up command and control, we may log a bunch of IP addresses or URLs that are known command and control. So we're really focused on um, extracting indicators of compromise from the kill chain, uh, which is very different from how at the attack framework works. Now, that's not to say I'm not, I'm not at all saying that people should just not care about indicators of compromise. They are good to enrich your data. So, you know, and, and it's good low hanging fruit. So at the end of the day, if you have an IP address, you know, 198.166.31.2, and you know that that's bad, well, you know, eliminate it, you know, block it or whatever you know, that's low hanging fruit, you know, so there's, there's nothing wrong with indicators of compromise, but it is not what's going to really detect the sophisticated intruder in your network. So as I mentioned, a kill chain provides really a 30,000 foot view of an attack. Uh, it's based on, um, you know, the attack framework is based on real world in the wild observations of actual behavior. So not just the the, uh, the indicators of compromise, but specifically around the behavior of that attacker. Um, it's purposely focused on the ad adversary and the behaviors they exhibit, and also the tools they use and the actions they performed. Um, it's not an open source threat intelligence feed like full of your IOCs. So again, I, I wanna be clear, I'm, I'm not saying that, I'm not advocating that we get rid of indicators of compromise, we still need them, but we really need to focus on understanding the behavior of the attacker in our environment. 
Uh, attack is community driven. So um, again, like I mentioned, when we look at attack, you're going to notice there's they source all of their intel. So for example, if um, if somebody has figured out that they're using, I don't know, APT28 is using PS exec in their um, lateral movement, um, let's say Microsoft figured that part out, they will actually source it. They'll say, you know, that here's the here's the uh, the source of that intel intelligence. So they take intelligence from all over the place, whether it's you know the crowd strikes of the world, the the various certs of the world, um, Microsoft, whoever, and they use that community driven data to basically uh, update uh, the information that goes into the attack framework. Um, it's knowledge. It's a knowledge base of adversary tactics uh, that you can use to defend your, your network from threats. Um, it's based on real, real in the wild observations, um, and it's focused on the adversary and their behaviors. So, uh, attack is a list of techniques by tactics, um, and uh, it doesn't follow a specific, necessarily a specific kill chain process. Uh, like a very defined sequence of events. So you could see, for example, um, there are all, a whole bunch of different tactics that are broken up into these various areas on MITRE, but it's not necessarily that you're specifically following a process the same way you are with a kill chain. Uh, the layout of attack is a series of, uh, as I mentioned, adversary tactics, uh, each of which are comprised of many techniques. Uh, the techniques are what, what one wants to detect, mitigate, and, and emulate when red teaming, for example. Uh, and we use this, in a, it's used in a tabular matrix form, which I'll show you in a second. Uh, it describes 110 different adversaries um, and 518 different uh, uh, techniques that are, that are as, there as part of uh, the attack framework. So here example, here's an example, uh, and like I said, it's, it's tabular. You could see here uh, the APT28 campaign, for example, all the highlighted yellow are basically all the different techniques that were used. So um, if you look closely, you could see things like, for example, um, under discovery, uh, for example, they did file and directory discovery. They did uh, peripheral device discovery, query reg they queried the registry. So, so for example, this provides me all of the different techniques that um, the APT28 campaign would have looked at um, across uh, every area from initial access to command and control and exfiltration. Uh, in comparison, APT29, for example, very different. You could see both had very different um, sets of techniques. Um, so right now, you know, if I identify um, if I identify these things in my environment, uh, it could be an indication of the attacker. Um, but you know, realistically, what attacks providing us is a really, really good list of techniques to be able to look for in our environment that might indicate uh, compromise. So as I mentioned, uh, there are uh, 178 techniques uh, in the system right now, um, and they're all broken down into those various areas. And uh, those techniques uh, break down into uh, a number of sub-techniques, which we'll see in a, in a few seconds. So the structure of the uh, technique and attack, here's an example of account access removal. So what they're gonna do is they provide a description of the actual technique they give you some examples of where this is being used. In this case, uh, Locker Goga. Uh, and then they provide a bunch of details like there's an ID ass assigned to it, um, any type of sub-techniques, uh, the tactic, the platforms it's applicable to, uh, what permissions are required. So it gives you an indication of whether or not elevated privilege is required to actually execute this technique. Uh, the data source, the impact type, and obviously the version. Now, the great thing is when we try to use, when we use an attack to basically build our, our use cases um, within, uh, within Sysmon, um, the use, for example, of that data source is really critical because it gives us an indication as to whether or not we can actually source out the technique using something like Sysmon. So if I look, for example, at account access removal, 
I know right off the bat from a data source perspective, the Windows event logs are, are in scope of being able to detect this technique, which means I can actually build a use case using my Sysmon data um, to, uh, to look for this technique in my environment. Um, you know, so, uh, so it's, it's a really, really good way of building that set of use cases and, uh, and seeing where, you know, what tools you would need to actually pull the data that you use to um, uh, eventually detect an adversary if he's in your environment. Um, the technique also shows us things like mitigations. Um, so for example, uh, it'll tell us how, how you can mitigate this technique um, and then uh, also shows us detection. So as I mentioned earlier, um, the use of, for example, event logs, I, I show the example here. Uh, now it's focused on traditional event logs, not Sysmon, but essentially it's saying, you know, 47, 23, 24, 26, and 40. Um, if you're monitoring for those, um, those events, um, it will give you an indication as to whether or not um, this specific account access removal technique is being executed in your environment. So it tells you alerting on net and these event IDs may generate a high degree of false positive, uh, baseline knowledge of how systems typically use and correlate modification events and other indications of malicious activity where possible. Um, so right now, if I wanted to build a, uh, a use case, I have a recipe now to be able to do that in Sysmon. Um, and the great thing is, you know, for example, the high degree of false positives, there are ways that we cannot um, limit false positives in the uh, traditional event logs, but we can in Sysmon. So, so anyway, really, really good source. And you're going to see when, when, we, when we, I go through the use cases I've brought um, to this workshop, you'll be able to see um, I've, I've put the relation back to to attack in my use cases. So when I show you use case, you'll be able to see how I, where I pulled that from out of the attack framework. So good, a good example of a tactic here. Um, attacker is convinced a clerk in a payroll in payroll to click a link on an email in inbox. So typical phishing, right? Series of uh, activities will execute on the clerk's machine unknowingly in the background. One of those items may be the execution of an attack technique PowerShell, uh, which is uh, a built-in Windows tool. Obviously, we know that it's it's used um, uh, legitimately, but it's also used maliciously by malware. Uh, um, command line visibility allows us to break down a set of strings that could be malicious. So for example, we're looking at things like download file, download string, base64 to string, invoke shellcode, encoded command. So the great thing is when we're looking at uh, when we're looking at this uh, from a from a detection perspective uh, on Sysmon, uh, and I'll, we'll get into this ad, ad nauseum later on. But when I'm looking at my PowerShell commands, uh, and I want to isolate potentially the use of PowerShell by a bad person, all I need to do is basically look for anything that's PowerShell, but then specifically look for command line arguments. So. Anytime I'm using a download file, download string, base64 to string, invoke shellcode, encoded command, well then basically I can really basically dwindle down um, possibility of using PowerShell for malicious reasons, right? So like the minute, for example, I detect somebody using, um, you know, basic or PowerShell and, and using an encoded command or trying to download a file, um, you know, then I can basically take you know, potentially, you know, a thousand PowerShell commands and uh, and dwindle that down to maybe, you know, 10 that I actually actively have to investigate, right? Um, so it allows me to actually look for things that are realistically probably not good on my network, um, but it's, it's better than having to sift through a thousand PowerShell commands and potentially miss one that's, uh, that, that I should be looking into. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's, it from a, from a, the attack perspective, it's great for adversary emulation. Uh, so identifying the adversary you want to emulate. So when you're doing, um, either, uh, tabletop exercises or you're gathering data about the adversary, 
Um, you can look for things like post exploit information. You can uh, specifically look at the tools, the aliases and campaigns, and look at time frame too. So when that attacker may have been really active, um, maybe an indication uh, as to whether or not it's specifically that attacker or something else. So here's just another example um, for APT28. So we know, for example, APT28 based on MITRE is the threat group that has been attributed by the Russian government. Group reportedly compromised the Democratic National Committee in April 2016. We have a list of known as, uh, known aliases. So we may know them as, you know, Fancy Bear, for example, um, uh, Strontium, uh, for example, and so on. Uh, we have a list of the techniques that they typically will use. So anything from uh, the use of run DLL 32 all the way to uh, credential dumping and so on. Um, we, we know the software they're going to typically use. So these are various pieces of malware, uh, remote access tools, that kind of thing. So anything from you say of use of Mimi cats to potentially um, dump uh, hashes um, all the way to uh, core shell or, or cert util. So, you know, again, being able to put all this information together and build a use case around it could allow us to detect that adversary in our network. And then they provide, as I mentioned earlier, they provide the reference of how they got this information. So for example, in this case, they got, they got their information from FireEye um, out of a uh, document that was released by FireEye called APT28, a window to, into Russia's cyber espionage operations. So everything comes from a specific source and they, they provide the details as to what that source is. So here's uh, what they call the, uh, the MITRE navigator. So this allows me to basically go through and, uh, and select specific tactics, uh, pull up any information related to those tactics and so on and so forth. Do we have any questions on attacks so far? I know we're reaching the first hour in, and I wanted to make sure if anybody had any questions. Um, so just just a, a, as a quick poll here, um, how many of you are actually using, oh, thanks, there's, uh, the next release is uh, of attack is going to be on the 29th of April. Uh, thanks for that post. Um, what, what can, can people post, uh, how many of you are, are a lot of you using attack today? Have you found it something that is valuable, something that you can easily integrate into your environment? Just curious if you guys want to post in the chat window. Uh, I'd love to see what your guys' thoughts are on this. Um, you know, I, I know a lot of people are using this on the hunting side uh, because it, it actually gives them um, a use case to hunt for. Uh, and I know there's a lot of uh, a lot of companies out there that are starting to build tool sets around you know ingesting attack tactics and using those as part of their uh, automated use cases. Um, a lot of them are using it to build the use cases for their SIM and SOCs. So yeah, a great uh, comment. It's great for red teaming and threat modeling as well. Absolutely. Uh, and quite useful for purple teaming exercises. Yeah, like I said, red, red teaming. Uh, I've got a red teaming team here that works um, at Grant Thornton. And uh, again, they mimic their um, they mimic their activities around attack. So uh, it's, it's great. It's a great tool. And, and it, was, uh, uh, it was great that MITRE took the time to put it out there. Super valuable, um, uh, especially if combined with, uh, with a data management layer. So there's uh, uh, a, URL, a URL here in the chat window um, if folks are looking. Um, So from, from an attack perspective, and you know what we want to do is extract the techniques that we need, look for those behaviors, store the info in a structured way, um, have the Intel uh, originator do it, start at the tactic level, uh, use the attack website examples. And again, uh, bringing in IOCs, uh, we want to enrich uh, our work with those IOCs. So again, I'm not trying to you know, replace uh, indicators of compromise with the attack framework. Um, I think both are important. One is focused on behavior. One is focused on enrichment uh, using those uh, those um, uh, IP addresses and so on. And like I said, IOCs are great low hanging fruit. It's a list. If we consume the list and we we block based on that list, 
we eliminate, you know, maybe we're eliminating 20% of the attack, uh, the attack um, uh, uh, landscape because we, we can eliminate that low hanging fruit. Uh, but again, the real, the real um, dedicated attackers are gonna be identified using the information in the framework more than anything. Um, some more examples. Here's one uh, T1088. So this is the type of thing we're going to see, and, and this is what we're going to build our Sysmon use cases around. So for example, uh, UAC bypass methods on modifying specific user acceptable accessible registry settings. So you can see here, um, there's a modification of these various registry keys. Um, so be, being able to mod modify registry settings for unauthorized change. That is a good a good thing to know because with Sysbon, I'm going to show you we're able to actually modify or sorry monitor the registry for changes. Now the great thing about again the the most amazing thing about the attack framework is it's not just telling me I, I should be monitoring the registry, okay? Because you know, I mean, if you have a large environment and you have you know almost frequent registry changes. That could be again that needle in a stack of needles, but what the folks at at Miter are telling me is, you know, monitor the registry, but look for changes to these settings, right? <clears throat> so now, if I'm searching, if I'm looking at my um, my Sysmon logs, I can specifically search for uh, not only a modification to the registry, but specifically a modification to one of these uh, three registry keys, right? So it's giving me the details to be able to identify T1088 in my environment, right? Another good example is uh, the use of run DLL 3032. Um, so again, uh, can be used to execute control panel items uh, through undocumented shell 32 DLL functions. Um, and so basically uh, what they're saying here is, uh, you know, being able to search for certain things, like they say down here, the use of JavaScript and so on. So th this is really giving us some really good details to be able to go and look for um, specific details as opposed to broad broad terms to go look for um, in our Sysmon logs. Um, and then the other thing to look at is to really consider the, the adversary's MO, like think about the why, what, and how at the end of the day. Um, here's just an example from last line. You can see here, uh, Buckeye seems to target file and print servers, which makes uh, makes it likely the group is looking to steal documents. Uh, here's another one. They're extremely proficient at lateral movement and typically do not reuse command and control infrastructure. And then the last one, the RAR SFX archive is created five to six months before this attack. Use the same RAR SFX archive and other payloads before this attack. So again, you know, as much as you can, you know, typically what I do is when I look at attack, I also look at the source and I'll go read the source document in many cases. So FireEye has developed a document on, on you know, for example, last line here has developed a document looking at um, Buckeye, right? So I may, even though I have the, the, attack, um, uh, the attack information from the attack framework, Work, I'll still go look at that document to really understand the reasoning as to why they do certain things. And I'm learning in this case that, for example, they're not going to reuse command and control infrastructure. So what does that tell me? Right off the bat, that tells me that indicators of compromise are going to be useless. Because if they're not reusing a CNC infrastructure, then that means they're going to have different IPs than what I may already know from an IOC, an IOC perspective. So I know right there that I can't necessarily rely on indicators of compromise to detect the command, that command and control traffic. Um, the other thing I'm looking at here as well is like they target file and print servers, okay? So maybe I need to be looking at in the, you know use cases specifically around my file and print servers. Maybe I need to be looking at things like the use of SMB or I have to be looking at uh, you know Active Directory attacks. Like this, is just giving me more information to uh, to better understand why a technique, or, or sorry, a, a, a tacti tech tactic, technique, and procedure has shown up in the attack framework. 
So at that point, it's all about mapping Sysmon events to attack. So essentially, you know, how relevant, uh, how is this relevant in our talk about Sysmon? Well, your logs are only as good as what you use them for. So again, like, you know, and, and that's where I see a lot of people, for example, using traditional event logs, they'll only log uh, in the access control side, they log all failed logins. So can anybody tell me, um, try to make this interactive, I guess, can anybody tell me uh, why logging only failed login attempts in your in your event logs is half half the information? Does anybody know? I'll give you guys a second. Brute force? Yes, exactly. Don't know if they succeeded. So that's the thing. Like, you know, you see brute force attempts, right? Fail, 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 fail. And then it stops. So you wonder at the end of the day, did they get in or did they give up, right? So if you're not logging that at, at that access, that successful access, then you're not going to have fail, 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 you know, success. And then you know they're you're they've they've cracked the password and they're in your environment. So uh, so again, those logs, figuring out exactly what you want to do with them, you know, again, those logs are great for sysadmins to use to detect, you know, problems with with their systems. But for us in the security side, is we really want to tie those to use cases, right? Um, you know, that's it's the same reason why we don't go into a sim environment and turn on all the default uh, the default content. And just start to say, you know, I, I'll go into a sock and they're like, okay, we've got all this data. What do we do with it? Well, no, you got to go the other way around. We have these use cases. What data do we need to fulfill those use cases? So it's important that we build out our use cases. Get another comment here. Yeah, so uh, Mirren says here, as a starter, deploy Sysmon with a proper config. Run Red Canary Atomics. I use Sigma rules to help you detect engineering, repeat atomics, map your detection coverage to MITRE framework. Very good, yeah, very very good. Um, so it's uh, you know we want it, we want we want these to be based on actual known TTPs, not simply always changing uh, indicators of compromised, and they should be based on like actual vetted campaign intelligence and not just assumptions at the end of the day. So that brings to play the endpoint problem. Um, so the endpoint problems, the endpoint is frequently used uh, entry into the network, obviously. Um, we have a number of uh, uh, EDR solutions that are great. Um, and in my case, I deal in a lot of scenarios in the uh, ICS space where uh, EDR solutions just aren't possible. So uh, whether it's uh, SCADA environments, uh, DCS environments, where uh, an EDR tool is just not possible. Um, so, and in many cases, they, they are, they're obviously quite costly. Uh, I'm not, again, uh, I'm telling people they should get rid of their EDR solutions, not at all. They, they are usually very good tools. Um, they can also be problematic. Um, so obviously there's an alternative approach using, uh, using attack. Um, it allows us to leverage our existing logging telemetry and basically, um, you know, coupling that with our um, our data platforms such as Splunk. And again, it could be anything. I'm just using Splunk as an example here. So it's critical as we uh, add new systems, networks, applications. Um, any type of hunting involves building new queries, tests to identify specific threats based on threat intel. So. One of the things we always want to remember there is as we're changing our environment, as we're adding new systems and so on and so forth, we always want to basically make sure that we're, um, we're uh, applying our Intel to those new systems, our environment. So from an endpoint perspective, there's all kinds of tools we have like event logs, there's there is Sysmon, which we'll talk about, uh, tools like OSEC, uh, you know, uh, FIM tools like Tripwire, um, you know, there's the use of PowerShell or WIMIC, uh, EDR tools, uh, traditional anti-malware, signature-based tools. There's things like Yara. There's all kinds of ways to be able to detect things that are not right on our endpoints. 
The interesting thing with an EDR tool though is, and, and these are not, they're not all built the same, but in a lot of cases, uh, EDR tools, there are, there are some that we've, uh, many, many know that uh, they are susceptible to bypass uh, using a number of techniques. Um, you know, I've, I've uh, just, just recently, I, I was doing a, a demo of, um, of one of the EDR tech EDR tools, and we we were able to to be able to bypass it. Um, uh, and the other thing is, uh, you know, some of the tools do not provide um, unfiltered EDR data. So you, you know, the whole point, obviously, originally for EDR tools, is they're going to be able to take their data that they're collecting and detect um, detect uh, you know uh, an attacker in your environment or something that's not correct. The problem is if that EDR tool uh, does not detect something, they don't provide you with, a lot of them don't provide you with the unfiltered data. So for example, if you have ABC EDR tool that doesn't detect something, um, but there is something going on, you won't, you won't have that data you can consume uh, from the tool to make your own judgment as to whether or not something is going on. So uh, in a lot of cases, these tools will start recording when they identify something suspicious um, and that data is not usable from a threat hunting perspective. So when you're filtering the data, you want to filter what the adversary is doing. Um, so in, in this case, uh, and, and again, not all of the EDR tools work this way, but there are a, quite a few of them that will not provide unfiltered data to you which means that if they don't detect it, there's no actual data left over for you to do your own analysis at the end of the day. A good example here is if your EDR tool is collecting IP addresses concerning any alerts, well, you want to have all of the, all the IP addresses uh, because if, for example, one IP is, is not related to, uh, uh, is related to something the EDR tool didn't detect, or if there's, a reason you want to look at all the other addresses, you know, you're not going to get that in some EDR tools. So that kind of leads us into this thought of there's also the fact of the matter that, you know, in many cases, logs that we use will fail us. If we look at, for example, um, traditional Windows event logs. So a good example is uh, not Petya um, malware. Um, you know, obviously it caused a lot of economic damage. And one thing it used was uh, uh, the old trick of basically running uh, uh, w, w, e, w event tool uh, util C, clear security logs to clear the logs. So computers that were about to go offline uh, from NotPetya would have, would have been sent a strong signal of event ID 1102 event log cleared under the event logs. Uh, to any central logging system uh, to indicate that something was going on if the event logs were cleared. So in a lot of cases, um, you know, these log files, you know, are going to, we're going to fail us if they were going to be, uh, if they're going to be cleared off of our system. Um, so the other thing is network breach or, or how you're going to get hit with the malware. Uh, what was the understanding things like what, what the entry point was? Uh, did they spread between systems? Uh, what happened on a particular system? Um, and the built-in event, Windows event tooling will, is really, it's really difficult to answer a lot of those questions with um, the, the types of event logs we have today uh, natively within Windows. Um, so for example, process creates events Anything around DLL loading info is in many cases limited. Uh, network connection information can be too limited, uh, but on the other hand, it could be also too verbose. Uh, common attack behavior, uh, for example, threat injection uh, is not captured by event logs. Can anybody anybody give me comments here? If just looking at a raw event log, how much of you feel like a raw event log is just providing you like a whole ton of great information? Or when you look at it, you say, this is just so cryptic, it doesn't do anything for me. What are your thoughts in the chat? Do you guys find that, you know, Windows event logs, aside from looking when a service stops or something like that, are provide you a lot of really good information? Or do you guys find you have to rely more on a, a third party agent based tool?
needs to be correlated, yes. But even that, even the even the information that you're actually extracting from native event logs, yeah, I see people are relying on third party because even the information that you do correlate, it's still limited. It's like I find it every time I go into the event logs and I try to really understand what's going on, I find that it just it's it's there's very very limited data. Yeah, Sysmon otherwise not useful. So again. You know, we, we, I find that the native logs really, really will fail us in a lot of cases, right? Um, so obviously, we're all used to these typical event logs, the application system and security logs. Uh, all of our events are tracked with an event ID. Um, now, we do get some security events like, you know, users logged on or logged off. We get privilege use and object access. Um, and short of anything else, like, um, uh, third-party agents or what have you. Um, it is the, the single most important piece of security data on a Windows host. Uh, again, short of installing a third-party tool or even doing things like collecting uh, memory. So it is what we, you know, if, if we're going to rely on anything, it is probably the most important piece of data we have there. The unfortunate part of it is it's limited. It does not have all of the details that that are very important to us. And that's where kind of Sysmon comes into place at the end of the day. So um, some of the data limitations, um, in some cases, uh, some events are missing altogether. I don't know if you guys have ever witnessed this, but it's it's happened on my watch before where I just can't find events. They just don't show up in the event log. Uh, I know they've occurred, but they are not in there. Um, some events are missing uh, important information. So I've gone into events. Have you ever gone into an event and just kind of gotten an error, an error in the event, but there's no real data in it? That's happened too. Uh, there's no re really way to filter what is logged natively. So yeah, you can filter in a log management tool or in a SIM, but you can't filter the raw, you can't filter the data that's being created is what I'm trying to say. So like, for example, if if I don't want the, process ID. There's no way for me to filter that out of the logs as they're being created. So I don't have really a lot of control over what I want to log. I have to just assume that the operating system is going to log what it, what it, what I need in the event log. So for example, if we take uh, event 4688 or a new process created, it's going to give us stuff like the program name, the process path, the process ID, and some information about who executed the process. What programs are running on the host is again, very basic information. So again, we're gonna have that 4688 event. Uh, it does not log DLLs. Um, only most recent versions of Windows will log command line and parent process. Um, only the program name is logged, there's no hash. So I don't like, for example here, this process name of notepad.exe, I'm not provided a hash in the native logs. Now, app locker in audit mode will provide the hash, but it also won't provide parent process info. So I can't understand if anything like uh, injection has occurred and it doesn't give me any command line information. So, you know, again, I'm getting some information so I can tell there's been a new process uh, that was created. I have the process ID. I could tell you know the account that executed it and the time and date, but I really don't have a lot. And somebody mentioned uh, in the chat, oops, somebody mentioned in the chat uh, a little earlier that it's about uh, correlation, right? Well, this is a big deal. Like with the limited information I have, like it's a lot of times it's really hard to correlate events together. So if I'm trying to build a timeline of things that are occurring on my Windows box, uh, you know, default Windows event logs, in many cases, it, it's, it's really difficult to correlate and build a timeline at the end of the day. And that's where we come into uh, good old Microsoft System Monitor, uh, also known as Sysmon. So uh, we're at version 1302 right now. Uh, in the last little while, we've seen a tremendous growth in new versions of, and they're, I mean, the guys at uh, Microsoft are coming out with some really interesting things um, in, in the later versions of Sysmon, things that, you know, uh, 
just are, you know, are kind of deal break. They're just, they're game changers at the end of the day. So uh, developed by Mark Racinovich and Thomas Garnier. Um, so uh, it was developed as part of uh, um, internal use at Microsoft to detect potential breaches. So this came all from uh, um, Mark coming from SysInternals, which was purchased by Microsoft. Um, you know, there's a whole bunch of other tools um, uh, as part of SysInternals. Um, Sysmon is just one of them. Um, it's built on the Process Monitor Foundation. So if you're familiar with Procmon, uh, which is another SysInternals tool, it's built on that foundation, which allows you to track file and network access. And it's made to run headless without a GUI. So we wanted something, you wanted something that was as close to the event log as possible, but better, right? Um, and it was first released in a public version in 2014. The great thing is when they are updating this regularly, Mark is actually involved fairly heavily in the versions that come out. Uh, whether it's speaking on online, he'll do posts, he'll tweet stuff. So it's it's still very much a product that is is pretty critical in their in their uh, list of products that they're releasing. Oh, and it's free. I mean, for those of you who didn't already know that. Uh, so realistically, does not uh, does not create any really ma real major performance hit. Now again, no performance hit, but you know you can you can end up generating a, a real huge amount of data, right? So um, we'll talk about like configuration and filtering, but if you're if you're running like uh, all options and everything turned on, it could obviously create a huge amount of data. Now, obviously we could set limits within uh, if the event logging system to set the size of the data, but it can create a lot of data to have to sift through, right? So although it's not gonna create a performance hit, uh, CPU or memory hit, it, it does create a lot of data. Um, it uses the event tracing for Windows, so the ETW uh, mechanism to trace and log system events. Um, it is a user mode service and a kernel mode device driver. It's around two megs. Um, it has a 32 and 64 bit binary. Um, the service doubles as its command line front end. Um, it logs system activity in the event log, which we'll see, and it uh, has persistence. So it will survive reboots. All in all, it's, it's a great, great tool. Um, just a quick poll of our people out there. Um, a lot of you already using Sysmon or is this new for, you, for people on the call? Just out of curiosity, uh, if people are learning about Sysmon for the first time in this session or whether or not they're using it. Yeah, a lot of people are using it. Yeah, a lot of happy faces. I I could tell you when this came, oh yeah, good workstations and servers. Um, yeah, I could tell you when uh, when it came out, I was, ex you know, when I started really using it, I was just blown away by how much better it was than the, the, the event logs at the end of the day. Um, so from an evolution perspective, you could see here, uh, I just did a really quick timeline uh, up till 1302. Uh, so a lot of the, a lot of these versions, these minor versions are bug fixes. Um, the other interesting thing is, uh, depending on the version of Windows you're running, uh, Sysmon in many cases won't run on uh, like newer versions of Sysmon won't necessarily run on older versions of Windows. And I, I've always found it difficult to download existing or old versions of Sysmon. Um, it seems like when they put a new version online, they really want you to move to that version. Um, so you can see a lot of things they've introduced like version nine, <clears throat> they introduced uh, rule groups um, and with and or behavior. Uh, they introduced uh, DNS events in version 10. My, that was game changing. Do you guys remember when version 10 came out and you could actually log DNS events? independent of doing that on like your DNS server. So that was one of the big things where people were saying like, hey, um, I, I remember going to uh, to the uh, SOC at one of the companies I worked at. And I said, uh, I said, you know, we should be logging DNS events. And the person looked at me and, and I was working for a telco and they looked at me and they said, you're crazy. We can't log DNS events. There's just way too much data. And now I think of it like we could actually log a lot of this information at the endpoint and not even, you know, not have to, you know, we could worry about it at the endpoint and not have the hit of, of actually 
uh, pulling it from the DNS server itself. Um, so there, there's really good fixes. Uh, comment, worried about the possible performance impact on a server. Uh, I haven't really seen much of an impact. Um, I don't know if anybody has, but my experiences, it, it hasn't uh, been, uh, there hasn't been much of an impact uh, because it is using, even though it is an add-on product, it is using the logging and event management functionality that is built in natively through the EVT logs. So that tends to not create a lot of uh, performance overhead on the system. Uh, other things we saw like um, uh, support for capturing clipboard operations. That was another one that came out. So a lot of these later versions have been fixes to a bunch of things. Um, so uh, 13 had a process image tampering event um, and so on. So. Uh, so, you know, I don't expect this to stop anytime soon, uh, given the, the time between version 10 and version 13 was not very long. So, so the, again, why use Sysmon? And this is a, a really good example, is, is correlating basically events on a system. So being able to correlate all these different things that are happening on a system without using a, necessarily a third-party tool, uh, you know, whether it's uh, looking at uh, a whole host of different uh, um, activities that have been happening, right? So like looking at, okay, look, a, a registry key was created or deleted and, and then, you know, a module was loaded and then there was a connection to an IP address on a specific port. Um, then there was uh, files that were created and then uh, then basically a drive was like, like being able to correlate all these processes together in a single uh, in a single um, um, uh, single source of logging is fabulous. I mean, being able to do things like correlate events through process GUIDs, which I'll show you later, is my, is is game changing. I mean, it's it just provides us with really really good information that those um, of those uh, native event logs were not producing for us. So from an events perspective, uh, we have various, it creates various events, you know. Now the thing you're going to notice is the event IDs. If you're not familiar with Sysmon and you're familiar with uh, event monitor, um, the event monitor, uh, the, sorry, the event logging infrastructure, we had uh, earlier uh, events when you were back in the XP 2000, 2000 server 2003 days where we had um three digit uh, event IDs. Then we went into uh, server 2000, um, 2008 and uh, Windows 7 and so on. And we saw four digit event IDs. Well, what um, the Sysmon uh, folks did is they created their own set of event IDs using single and double digit uh, IDs. So not to confuse these with any other events that are occurring in other logs, other event logs in the event logging system. So for example, 4688, uh, which is process created um, in the event logs will be a, an event ID of one. So, uh, so there's no confusion there when I'm basically listing my events. So there are a lot of events here that are, have reciprocals in the event, Windows event native event log service, but there are some here that you're not gonna see in, uh, in, in the Windows event logs uh, is with a reciprocal event, uh, a four digit event log. So like, you know, there's everything from uh, process create, anytime that um, the Sysmon service is tampered with, uh, that's gonna log an event ID of four, uh, uh, whether we're loading images, uh, event of seven, uh, all the way to process access, uh, anything that involves a registry, you're gonna see in events uh, 12, 13, and 14, uh, file creation, um, configuration of Sysmon changes, you'll get an event 16. Um, our new ones are our DNS events or event 22. Um, and then in the new versions, we have these clipboard changes. Uh, so when there's new content that's been added to clipboard, uh, we're gonna get an event ID 24, as well as this new uh, process tampering uh, event that was added uh, in recent versions. So as you can see, we're, we've got a whole list of new event IDs that we have to we have to worry about. Um, but the good thing is, and it, it's not to say to stop using your your native event logs. Um, 
there's a reason there's reasons to use those but these are totally separate and uh, you don't have to worry about the confusion between the two types of event logs so uh there are two ways to get uh process creation logs for example between event logs and sysmon logs uh, for event logs you need to actually uh, enable uh, your auditing group policy setting you have to enable audit process creation uh, to log to success uh, for you to get that 4688 log so right there there's a step that has to happen whereas with sysmon uh, that event id one is created without any updates to your 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 security policies so no changes to any gpos have to happen to be able to get that event log of one <clears throat> So your process creates going to create a number of different fields. Uh, I've got, for example, on the left, you've got a Sysmon event. Um, and on the right, you've got the same event, but in, in a 4688 uh, Windows security event. So you can see on the left, I'm going to see things, uh, you know, whether it's time and so on and so forth. And I'm going to see certain things on the right. To break that down, uh, and this is a good comparison here. So. For example, uh, on the event logs, I'm going to see what they call a new process name, which is the name of the process that was executed, including the full directory path to the executable. Um, uh, with this field alone, you can frequent you can do frequency analysis to see if there are any tools or commands being run at unusual directories. So, out of the EVT logs, it's called new process name. On the Sysmon side, it's called image. Uh, I have also my process command line. So if the process was logged with any options or command line arguments, this field would capture it. So an example, um, you know, if you're watching PowerShell, like I mentioned earlier in the presentation, and they're using the ENC or encoded command option, that might be a command line argument you really want to look for because it's indication that PowerShell may be being used for something other than legitimate purposes because we typically maybe are not encoding things um, in, in production. Um, allows users to pass base64 strings to PowerShell and allows PowerShell process to decode and execute the string. So we know that attackers tend to obfuscate what they're trying to do with PowerShell. So again, it might be an indication that PowerShell is being used by a non-legitimate user. So when you're looking for that in an EVT log, you're looking for that process command line uh, field, whereas with Sysmon, you're looking for the command line field. Uh, we also have the uh, the account security ID or the account name. So this lets you know who created the process in question. Uh, the audit log further breaks this down into the creator and target subjects for the process in question. For example, it's unusual for a user from the accounting department to run a command like netstat or who am I, uh, but these commands might not be usual unusual for a systems administrators group. So it allows you to basically start to build use cases around uh, commands that are typical uh, commands, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, attackers are using a lot of the typical syst systems administrator commands uh, for being able to collect, uh, uh, being able to collect intelligence for themselves. So, for example, if if a user, a regular user, got breached, and all of a sudden that user is starting to execute some commands that are kind of out of the ordinary for that type of user. Well, then maybe that's a maybe that's a use case you want to look for. So in this case, if I'm using EVT logs, I'm looking for the security ID or the account name versus Sysmon, where I'm looking for the user. Timestamp, they both have timestamps for the events. Uh, Sysmon is awesome because it provides times in uh, in UTC field in UTC uh, version. So if you look at the UTC time field, you're going to get your timestamps in UTC, which is great. Uh, in either case, it's important. Uh, to look for executions, uh, execution of processes that are outside of a user's given working hours. Again, this is again looking at behavior, right? So if I have a typical, if typically I don't see certain things happen um, after you know five o'clock, and then all of a sudden I'm seeing users execute something very regularly at two in the morning, or if I'm basically investigating that more and I look and I see. Well, look, this user is executing something at two in the morning. It's it's out of the ordinary that they're executing that process, 
But when I go and look up that user, that user's in a time zone uh, where where it would be two in the morning, and that would be very um, um, not uh, abnormal for them, right? This is also really good at detecting things like insider threat, uh, looking for users that are doing things outside of business hours because they're trying to either sabotage a system or exfiltrate data that they need, right? Here's where we get some interesting areas. So hashes. So this was the first thing when I started uh, when I started uh, looking at Sysmon, this was the first thing that caught my eye was the fact that native EVT logs do not hash the executable that's being run through that process create. So for example, um, and, and we'll see how this all works in, in Sysmon in a little bit, but um, the great thing about those hashes is they allow you to understand whether that process is legitimate or not. So for example, if somebody's running notepad.exe, I have the hash in my process create. I can take that hash, I can look it up and I can see if, well, if that is really notepad.exe or if it's something bad, right? I'm sure all of you could probably comment and tell me how much that game changer happened when they introduced hashes into this, right? Um, parent image, uh, almost all processes spawn have a parent-child relationship because uh, we know Windows is obviously multi-threaded. Uh, that is one process responsible for spawning another process. We got a comment here. Automatic, yeah, uh, so a couple comments that came in. Uh, event ID 26 added a few days ago. File delete events without without archiving. Thank you. Yes, very good. Obviously, my, my slides were prepared in a little bit in advance. Automatic test with VT API, yep. Uh, yeah, so using using the virus total API, it's it's awesome. Yeah, like I said, hashes were just mind blowing. I said no more EVTs. I'm using Sysmon from now on, just around hashes. And I got some really good use cases. You'll see about that. Uh, so parent image. So for example, if you're using Windows 10 and you double click a link for Firefox to start Firefox web browser, um, you know there's going to be child processes that are created. Uh, this field tells you the name and the path of the process that was responsible for launching the process being reviewed. So it's normal for Firefox to be launched by explorer.exe. Uh, having explorer.exe as a parent for SVC host is not normal and definitely should be looked at. So this is a really good example of where, for example, um, PowerShell is, is spawning things like other processes. So like, for example, if you have the net command and that's being spawned by PowerShell, well, that might be an indication that PowerShell is being used to gather Intel for an attacker. So really understanding, for example, um, you know, what is normal from a parent-child relationship perspective versus something that somebody's trying to hide. So attackers will tend to try to hide their parent-child relationship um, you know, that could be a good indication that something is not right on your system. Uh, parent command line. So again, a lot like the command line field that we mentioned earlier, uh, except this field shows you the arguments that were passed to the parent, to the parent process that spawned the process being reviewed. So again, using that PowerShell example, um, uh, process creation log for a new executable that we've never seen before. Um, and we see it, uh, its parent process is PowerShell and the command line is PowerShell exe uh, with this dash exec bypass and then basically the base64 encoded command. So that would definitely look suspicious at the end of the day. So again, we could see that, you know, in many cases there's similarities between the two, but then Sysmon kind of goes in a different direction and adds a lot more telemetry to what we're looking at. So let's look at native events. Let's let's do a little bit more comparison between 4688 and and uh, um, process ID one or sorry event ID one. So Sysmon events uh, to detect new EXEs and DLLs. So we all know that EXEs and DLLs are both PE files. They're very similar. Um, and we also know that um, you can also ex execute a DLL 
uh, attackers will do it uh, in many cases. Uh, so for example, this could have been used to detect ransomware such as Petir or WannaCry, which used SMB to spread, we all know that. Uh, so the work was done by an EXE. If we would have been looking for that new unknown EXE in DLLs, we may have been able to identify Petia or WannaCry early on in the process. I think we just have a QA here. So a couple questions. Uh, would be nice to have your thoughts on logging what to log Windows environments. Do you have guidance or Docker? We're going to talk about that. Absolutely. So we will talk about that when we look at use cases. Uh, sorry for coming in late. Yes, we will be recording the webinar. And uh, if you missed anything, you have questions, I can be accessed afterwards, but it's good to have you. Um, so yeah, so if we would have known, uh, if we would have been looking for new uh, unknown EXEs and DLLs, we may have been able to find Petya or WannaCry. So for example, event ID 4688, as we know, uh, is process creation for success, uh, is a security log event produced every time an EXE loads a new process. So when a Firefox is loaded, we're going to see a new process creation 4688 event for Firefox, for example. So if we keep running a baseline of known EXE names, right, and we compare each 4688 event against that list, you'll know as soon as something's new, for example, Petia's EXE is running on your network. Now, again, this is a hypothetical example because that would create a lot of data, at least on our servers, right? If we knew that, uh, if we had a baseline of those EXE names and we load them into our SIM, for example, if you brought them into Splunk or something, you have a list of all the EXEs that will run on your server. You take the time, you figure all that out and you create a list. And then basically you now are monitoring your event logs, your 4688 event logs. And every time something, a new EXE name pops up and it doesn't match on your list, your SIM will now kick out an alert or uh, show you something in a dashboard or what have you, right? So it's this is strict basic baselining that we do with things like FIM or you know using Tripwire or what have you. I have a list of known EXE names that I've baselined. Something pops up that's not in that list. I send an alert. Great, right? That's fabulous. Well, that's based on the name of the EXE. Uh, including the path. So what happens if the attacker uses a name similar to that of the known file or overwrites an EXE? What if they're running it as notepad.exe, right? They've overridden notepad.exe and they're running their malware as notepad.exe. Well, it's not gonna show up in my abnormal list. It's gonna show up in my baseline list because notepad.exe is normal. So if the minute that somebody runs Notepad, I get a 4688 event runs and Notepad does not match um, my, it matches my list of known uh, EXE names. Well, I'm never gonna know about it, right? So being able to know, uh, being able to identify malicious processes based on the name alone is not sufficient, correct? Well, that's where this hash comes into place, right? And, and so essentially, Sysmon is going to log the hash of the EXE. So every time uh, an event ID 1 is created at the same time as 4688, it's going to also provide the hash of the EXE. So even if the attacker replaces the known EXE with uh, a bad one, they replace notepad.exe with something else, I'm still going to get a hash, right? So now I'm not comparing just against uh, a name of an EXE, which is a simple thing to, to obfuscate. I'm now actually looking at it from a hash perspective, right? So you take the hash and like uh, we, we plop it into VirusTotal. And this is an old screenshot, I apologize. Uh, but uh, very much like uh, somebody mentioned using the VirusTotal API, I can, now, uh, I can now identify if a file, that process that was created, if that process, that file, is actually legitimately notepad or it's something bad like wanna cry, right? This is like, I know this seems so, you know, trivial and basic, but it's 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 a game changer. Just if 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 all that Sysmon would do for me is just produce a hash, I'd be content even with that. I mean, that's an amazing thing to have, 
right? So um, some other things we're going to see between the two uh, process creation with full command line for both uh, current and parent process, which includes the process GUI, GUID in the process create events to allow us to correlate events. And I'm going to show you this later in a use case, but the great thing with the process GUID is as I execute a process, I now can track uh, other things happening um, as that uh, uh, through that process GUID essentially, right? Um, and you can also log network connections. Um, and these are these are optional things you can turn on in Sysmon uh, because like w there was a mention about performance, logging network connections obviously are gonna create a lot of log files. So um, so this, this is an option that you need to turn on, but we're also gonna see how you can use configuration files to specifically limit what you're you're creating, so there, you know, the folks that the folks that sys internals weren't stupid. They said, "Well, look, if we enable all these great things like logging network connections, we also have to find a way to basically be able to tailor what you're actually co collecting, because if we collect everything, it's just going to be a nightmare, right?" What do you suggest to perform the exe hash file name stacking comparison at scale? Ah, Maxime, I will show you that. We have a use case for that. Um, and it's going to involve uh, using a SIM. I'm going to show you how to do that. It's really, really cool. Great, great question. So why are Sysmon events so important compared to event log events? Well, our event ID 11, for example, file create, useful for monitoring auto start locations. So essentially, if I'm doing, a, now again, you got to kind of put this into your mind, right? We're looking at just Sysmon right now. We're not looking at, what we would do all the events, but think about this in a sim a sim environment, right? So if I'm, for example, logging file creates on my my critical servers, right, and um, I have a I have a use case that says, typically, if I look at the attack framework, and again, we're gonna we'll go back to that. Uh, auto start locations are typically these places, you know, the temp directory or whatever. And in, anyway, these typical places, right? <clears throat> if I create a use case to say, look, if I have an event ID 11 and it involves these directories, those are potential malware drop locations, then, you know, alert me or create a report or what have you. Um, so again, tying that back to the attack framework, right? If I have an event ID 12 or registry event, object create or delete. So I'm, I'm deleting an object in the registry or I'm, or I'm creating one. It's useful for monitoring change to the registry auto start locations or specific malware registry modifications. So a lot of times malware wants to ma maintain persistence. So it's gonna go and create stuff in your auto start locations, your run once, your run uh, keys in your, in, your, in your registry hives. You know, if you're monitoring for those and it's out of the realm of, out of, the realm of normal, well, those again could be, um, could be potential uh, events. I've also seen organizations that tie these to their to their service now, their change management system. So they're able to tell uh, no change was specifically um, no change was specifically scheduled for yesterday, but I'm seeing a whole bunch of registry changes. So you know, flag those, right? Uh, event ID 17 pipe event. So malware often uses named pipes or inter-process communication. So when a pipe is created that is another indication that malware might be trying to communicate on my network, right? Question about hashes, it's necessary to log different types of hashes or is it okay to stick with SHA-256? So what we will find with, uh, we will find with um, uh, uh, Sysmon is it can log various types of hashes. We'll see that in a little bit. It will log uh, MD5, SHA-256, IMPASH, um, in, in which one will you choose? Uh, I typically do SHA-256 mainly because um, a lot of the tools that I'm, I'm actually looking those hashes in now are starting to really focus on that as the hashing algorithm. Uh, but I mean, at the end of the day, MD5 is still pretty much used in a lot of cases. I, I mean, you know, being able to worry about things like uh, uh, collisions and stuff, I mean, it's not a big deal. Um, but uh, yeah, I typically do... Um, uh, SHA-256, it, it'll all depend on what you're using the hashes for, 
but for the most part, most of them are, are being, are being, are being supported. So. So Sysmon is also going to allow us to build a successful timeline. It will allow us to detect changes in file creation time to understand when the file was really created. Um, it'll uh, a modification of the file creation timestamp is also a technique commonly used by malware to cover its tracks. Uh, so generating events from early in the boot process to capture activity made by sophisticated kernel mode malware. So this is one of the really cool th things about Sysmon is it starts capturing really, really, really early in the boot up process. Because again, it isn't a third party, well, it's a third party product. Well, no, I guess it isn't, it's a Microsoft product, but it's not like installing a third party agent or a third party logging tool that might start up as a service later on in the process. Because this is tied directly to uh, like the, the kernel mode, uh, sorry, the, the driver is tied directly to the event logging infrastructure it starts up really early in the boot process. So if you have kernel mode uh, malware that basically starts to infect early on, you're still gonna be able to detect those, uh, those events early on in the process. Do we have any questions so far on, on kind of the, the sort of introduction stuff to Sysmon? So let's do this. Let's talk about installation and configuration, and then we'll take a, a break. I give you guys. Uh, I'm 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 getting a little low on on go juice, if you know what I mean. Um, and uh, we'll so we'll talk about installation and configuration. I do have uh, um, a lot of stuff use case wise that I have demos. If the demo if the demo gods don't don't work with me today, I do also have screenshots. So we'll see we'll see how that goes. <clears throat> so installing so installation is actually really simple like right out of the box it's a pretty simple thing so as i mentioned there is a 64-bit and a 32-bit version of sysmon um, and so the basic 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 installation is you run uh, at the command line you run sysmon minus i now there's the all like with all the other uh, uh turtles tools they do have a EULA agreement you have to accept. Um, so if you're trying to do this with uh, um, zero, uh, you know, if you if you want to have zero interaction with the installation, you can do a minus accept EULA, and that will accept the agreement without you having to actually um, click the button when it pops up. Seems the most promising Sysmon install packages I've ever found. Any experience or comments using? Uh, so I have not used that before. I'm gonna show you a bunch of alternatives, but that is a good one. Uh, so there's uh, somebody posted one from uh, on GitHub under joke zone, there's an update Sysmon uh, uh, installation update package. I'll show you what I've done, but uh, yeah, I've, I haven't used that one before, Marcus. Uh, so essentially when you run that Sysmon minus I, it's gonna extract binaries into the system root of Windows it's going to register. Uh, it's going to register with the event log manifest. So uh, it is part of the event log process. Uh, it enables a default configuration, um, and there's some obviously a bunch of options we can add on. So things like the hashing uh, method and so on and so forth. You can install from a network location. So you can do a uh, slash slash server name slash sysmon except eula minus i blah blah blah. And then it'll copy its files from to the local system over the network. You can also do scheduled task updates. So here's the really cool thing with Sysmon, and I'm going to show you configuration files. But your configuration files are are vast. They they um, turn options on on what you're going to actually um, um, log, but they also allow you to exclude and include things. So the great thing about this, and you can you can change configuration uh, files on the fly, like there's no re and there's no reboots or anything like that. So for example, let's say I'm in an IR situation where I'm specifically have uh, a list of indicators or, or behaviors that I know of. Like so, let's say I know the attackers in my environment, and I'm trying to identify which servers he's on. So I've, I've figured out like there's five things he's doing. 
So what I can do is I can create a configuration file that will only log areas around those five things. And then I could push it out in on the fly. So this is a really cool thing. It's so it's so modular the way it works is I can create those configuration files and then I can push them out. So, so for example, in that IR situation, I might wanna focus my time on specifically those five things. So I create a new configuration file and then I, re, I, up, I basically um, reload Sysmon with that new configuration file. And it's as simple as doing a minus C and then pointing to where the configuration file is. And now I'm logging something different. So it doesn't involve having to like download some big thing and reinstall an MSI package and all it. It's that easy. And you can do it with PS exec, PowerShell, whatever you wanna use, right? So once you do the install, the service log events, logs events immediately does not require a reboot um, either for an install or an uninstall. So this is great. This means you have very little touch on the server itself and you can deploy uh, real time and not have to worry about uh, a reboot. Like, oh, you know, how many times have you installed something that is critical in, in, your, in your security uh, monitoring, but you have to wait like a month to the next change window to reboot. So that's a month you're just sitting there waiting. Well, you don't need to worry about that with, uh, with, with uh, Syspawn. The driver installs the boot start driver and it captures activity, as I mentioned earlier in that boot, early in that boot process. Um, it does not replace your event logs. So this is great. So when you're going, because when you're going to your sysadmins, if they're not familiar with Sysmon and you say to them like, I want to install this package to get better event logs, they may say, well, no, 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 no. We have a tool where we look at for events like 4688, you can't remove our, our event logs. Well, you can reassure them that even though it uses the same infrastructure, it's totally separate. The logs are totally separate. You create them in parallel. So as you're creating event logs, traditional event logs, you're creating Sysmon logs at the same time. Um, you can also reload the installation, like I said, if you want to add options. So for example, if something uh, you decide you not you really want to start logging some network events you can actually as i mentioned very similar to that ir situation you can actually um, reload the configuration file so when you want to automate the deployment and i know there was a question about this earlier um, there's so many ways to automate the deployment i mean you could do the manual thing like i showed you you can do it over the network manually, but you can also use um, tools like Ansible, Chef Puppet. You can even use PS Exec and write PowerShell scripts if you want. Um, or a lot of people typically use GPOs to do this. So like, for example, uh, oh, we got, a, we got a question here. What's mentioned in the default Sysmon config when no config is provided? We'll get to that actually. Uh, Mr. Anonymous or Mrs. Anonymous M att attendee. We will talk about the default configs in a, in a little bit. Uh, and we have another question in the, oops, sorry, in the chat. Are there specific requirements in the event logs that we should take into account? I, do you mean in the traditional event log or in the, like, I don't even use the, I don't even use the event logs anymore now that I have Sysmon. Uh, are you talking about specific requirements we should be looking into on the Sysmon side or in the existing event log side? I'll let you answer that question. Uh, yeah, so this is, as e this is pretty easy to do. So here's a really quick installation batch file. Uh, so essentially what you're doing is you load your config file uh, you load your config file on a on a server somewhere on your network. So you do a copy of that config file to your Windows directory, and then you essentially run sysmon minus c, uh, and basically pointing to that config XML file. Um, and then you basically do your you start it and so on and so forth. So it's it's pretty easy. Here's your install at the bottom, sysmon and your config file that you've copied over. Um, and then all all you basically do is you create a scheduled task. Uh, from a from a group policy perspective, and then when uh, when the machine uh, comes online, it goes through, uh, loads that scheduled task, 
looks to domain whatever your wherever your your server is, um, and runs that installation batch file, which copies the file down and runs Sysmon. So it's as simple as doing this. You can use SCCM as well. I mean, it's it's because it's such a, a very light program. There's no in, there's no real installation. It's you install it at the command line. So there's no there's no wizard or anything like that. It's that simple to install, right? Uh, are there any specific requirements in the event logs that we should take into account in the existing event log side? Like I said, uh, you know, I for security related events, I typically only look at at Sysmon now. I don't even look at the event log because uh, you know there's just so much augmentation in the Sysmon events um, that I don't even look at them now. The great thing is if for some reason somebody, you know, if an attacker messes with Sysmon, you still have the, the native event logs um, to look at. So they're, they're still there. Uh, which configuration file do you recommend for production? Okay, we're gonna talk about that as well. And we're gonna also talk about Olaf's modular Sysmon uh, config as well as Swift on security. Jeez, you guys, you guys, I'm, I'm not teaching you anything. You guys are all the experts. You should be teaching this course. Uh, hopefully I can give you something. Uh, you guys are, this is great. I am so thrilled that folks of this call are using Sysmon because it is, like I said, it's a real game changer, right? So where are these new logs event, where are these new events stored? Well, they're actually stored. Um, so I'm going to actually go to, I'm going to come out of here. I'm going to actually show you where they are. Can everybody still see my screen? Am I still sharing uh, my screen here? I think I am. Yeah, especially DNS 22. What a game changer. Yeah, exactly. I love the excitement, guys. This is this is a great end of the week thing for me. So uh, it's pretty simple. You go into your event log viewer. You guys are familiar with this. Now you're you guys are uh, familiar with going into your event logs and looking at your security events. So I'm going to see my typical events here. You could see, uh, well, here. Look, I just ran. You know, a handle to the object was created. Let's see if, here. Here's a good process creation. So here's a typical one. Here's Splunk PowerShell. So here's that stuff for the universal forwarder for for Splunk. So there's there's you know this is the typical thing we're going to look for. When you want to look for your Sysmon events, you're going to go into your applications and services logs under Microsoft, Windows, and you're going to scroll all the way down to Sysmon. And there's going to be a log called operational. And this is where your Sysmon logs are, are kept. So you're going to see, I mean, it looks pretty much the same as what you'd see. The difference is between this is your event IDs. You notice they're all single and double digit events. Ones and 13s and so on. There's a 22 mentioned earlier, DNS query. Um, so that's the big difference you're going to see is that your, your, the event log is going to be created somewhere else. So this is important. If you're using a tool to consume that log, you got to make sure you're consuming the right log and where it's actually located. So there, that's, the, that's where you're going to actually get them at the end of the day. They're going to be in that Microsoft Windows Sysmon operational uh, folder in the event viewer. A couple of things before we take our break. Deployment, this is another thing that a lot of people don't think about, but it's very important detail to, to Sysmon is the size of the applications and services logs, Microsoft Windows Sysmon operational log, the log file I just showed you. The default size will not collect much of anything as the data is going to roll in minutes or faster, depending on what you're collecting. If you are collecting 22, event ID 22 or DNS, and you have a very active machine. So for example, if you're doing, um, so typically it will talk about workstations versus servers. Typically when I deploy to a workstation, I deploy a very limited set of logging because there's a lot more user interactivity on a workstation versus a server. So for example, and, and you, you probably shouldn't do this, but typically administrators are not gonna log in RDP to a Windows server and start doing like running Chrome and visiting websites. Hopefully people aren't doing that. So I'm not gonna have a lot of, you know, 
22 event 22 DNS logs because I'm not going to have as as much as I would on a workstation where a typical user is going to be surfing the internet, right? So you have to be very careful in those things when you're looking at them. So the default log size is going to uh, is going to reach its max pretty quickly, and then you're going to start to roll over your events, which means you're not going to get a lot of things. You're you know unless you're using a sim and you're you're collecting logs and you're storing them. Um, natively, you're going to run out of space. So what you want to do is you want to basically use the uh, WEVT util tool, and you want to grow that. You want to grow that log, obviously. So that so basically by doing this EV util, you're going to you'll be able to see how big the log size is by default, and you can see here this max size six one six seven one zero eight eight six eight eight six four. That's the default log size for your um, your Syspon log when you create it by by default. So if you run that that the the uh, event log util tool with a GL, you'll be able to see how big the log size is by default. <laughs> so uh, just a comment uh, that Syspon version thirteen covered DNS events, file delete, clipboard change. Yep. Uh, not a problem. Come, sorry for coming in late. That slide was actually we we talked about that earlier, so I covered off that those were added those those events, but we will be covering them off as well in the use cases. No need to be uh, apologized for coming in late, guys. I'm just glad to have you on the on on the on the event. So, uh, what is monitor uh, default config? We'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, so, what I highly recommend is that you basically update the Syspon uh, size to set it to uh, to set it to this so that essentially you want it and that shouldn't be gigs. Yeah, one gig essentially. Uh, so essentially what you want to basically make sure is that that log file is going to grow to a size where we can actually, you know, have usable logs. So either using the WEVT util um, sizing, you want to size the security security log. You want to set the operational log to a number of bytes. So you can either do it with the WEVT util, and this shouldn't be security. It should be the event, the um, operational security log file size. You want to set that, or you can actually do it manually in the event viewer as well. Very, very important. Um, so the other thing you want to also think about is if you've already deployed an antivirus or an EDR solution, you want to make sure that your Syspon binary uh, and driver is excluded from being scanned. Uh, this can perf this can create performance impacts uh, because of the how how often your Syspon binary is actually working, uh, as well as during the installation of the binary through GPOs. You want to make sure that your antivirus or EDR solution. Uh, as well as whether you're using a, a whitelisting solution, you want to make sure that those don't tamper with the deployment of your of Syspon or the uh, the the regular scanning every time it's being run. Uh, so I, I already did show you I I did show you that uh, EVT versus Syspon event uh, earlier. You saw like we brought up for example um, Syspon. Here's like a process create. You could see, look at the amount of data. So for example, look at the amount of data here. So that is a process, uh, an event ID one process create for uh, for with login compared to, something like that, Oops, something like this. So you can see there's a big difference, right? And we'll get into that a little further. Uh, given we're at uh, we're at the hour, uh, why don't we do this? Why don't we take a, uh, a fifteen? Like, why don't we? I want to check. Does anybody have any questions so far uh, before we go into the break? And I know there's a bunch of questions in here. We I'm pretty sure we're going to be answering all this as we go through. I've been checking to see what people have as questions. Uh, does anybody have any questions? And what we'll do is we'll go and. Uh, We'll take a good 15 minute break um, and uh, grab some uh, some coffee or whatever and uh, uh, check your emails. And let's say we meet back here at uh, 
well in 15 basically 20 20 minutes after the hour that sounds good for everybody everybody good with that 20 minutes after the hour cool all right see everybody then i'm going to get some coffee cuz i'm i'm dying here i need coffee
All right, everybody. Thank you, Josh. I'm going to I'm going to close off some of those actually. So question by Nicholas was whether Nick, we can log only failed queries with event 22. I believe we can filter those out through the, there's a field called query status. Um, and I believe that can be, we could filter that out through the query status field. Um, I'll double check, but I believe that we can do it through there. Um, and, and if we can't, you can obviously, if you, if you consume it in a SIM, you'll be able to see stuff there. Everybody can hear me okay, I'm assuming. All right. So config files. So again, Syspawn is great, but it can log a huge amount of data. Like, you know, if specifically like, you know, workstations, for example, versus servers, they have a lot of user interaction. They create a lot of a lot of data, a lot of process launches, and then obviously every time you load a process, uh, we're loading DLLs. So there's just a lot that's happening. Network connections now with things like event event twenty two with DNS, this can obviously add up pretty quickly. And it's not just the size of the file; it's just the amount of data it actually have to have to parse through, right? So Sysmon includes the ability to filter these events before they are written to the event logs. So this is key. And this is something that your event logs, uh, your native event logs do not do. There's no way to um, to filter your, your logs before they're actually, or filter your events before they're written to the log. So with Sysmon, you can actually build uh, your own, or you can download a number of configuration files that are available uh, for download that others have created for us. Um, so the configuration files are XML based and they contain a rule to capture or discard certain events. Now they also include, uh, we used to, in earlier versions of Sysmon, when we wanted to uh, you know, do things like specify the uh, hashing algorithm that's gonna be used, those used to be done at the command line during the install. Now they're actually part of the configuration file. Um, and they obviously make it easier to deploy uh, to filter specific captured events. So you can do things like, uh, for example, if you only want to log network events from processes named iExplore.exe or located in, sys, uh, in C colon backslash users, drivers that aren't signed by Microsoft, you, it's up to you how you want to do this and, and your, the use case you want to use. So you either want to, you know, it, it, like I said, it could be an, an IR situation and you're deploying a new configuration file because you're looking specifically for some some specific lateral movement that you've detected. So it's as easy as syspawn minus i, as we saw before, the accept EULA, and then the path to the config file. And then as mentioned earlier, you can also do the minus C and you can update syspawn with a uh, newer version of the config file. So like I have like, for example, a server full of different versions of config files for different things. And I will update syspawn as I see fit based on you know, is it a regular day or am I dealing with an incident, right? Uh, you know, you can specify things like the hashing algorithm, as I mentioned earlier, um, is just a configuration item in, in the config file. So you see there, we have our XML item there, hash algorithms, and then we specify which ones we want, or we could do a star and have everything on. So MD5, SHA-1, SHA-256, or impash, right? Um, we can also do things like enable network connect, network connect, which is logging of all network connections. Now this obviously, I say performance hit, but it's really, you know, it's it's a logging hit. It's gonna create, a lot, your log files are gonna fill up really, really quick. And um, performance wise, if you're doing like, uh, Windows event forwarding, or you've got a universal forwarder Splunk, like those are the areas where you could have some performance issues, not necessarily from uh, Sysmon itself. Um, so for example, if I'm looking for Firefox command.exe or PowerShell.exe, 
I can actually do um, a network connect on match. So you can see it here down here, network connect on match includes image condition contains chrome.exe. So what this is gonna say is that anytime that there is a network connection that is including an image that has the name that contains the name chrome.exe, well then uh, I wanna log that. So as you can see here in, in the event mon monitor, I, I can see my chrome.exe is logged. So uh, in the same way you can do this, you can also exclude things, right? So if you don't want to see Chrome because there's so much Chrome.exe tra you know, log traffic, then you can actually exclude it as well. Uh, you can specify the image condition. So enable logging image, uh, image loaded events. So if you want to lo log only specific images, and again, this is something you may want to do in an incident specific, in an incident response. So for example, if if you wanna you wanna log in this case anything that um, uh, any image condition uh, any time that Chrome is launched in event seven, you can basically uh, you can basically do that. So any type any time image loaded is equal to Chrome.exe, then basically it'll it'll log an event. Uh, another thing a lot of people don't know is if you use the minus C switch. In, on, on the command line. So if you do a sysmon or sysmon64.exe minus C, it'll actually tell you which items are, uh, are enabled in sysmon. So if I ran this, for example, you see like the hashing algorithm is SHA-256. I'm not logging network connections. Uh, I am not logging image loading. Uh, and I am logging DNS lookup, for example. Um, so it allow you, and there's no specific rules loaded. I'm this. Is, so a person was asking what the default was earlier. Well, there's your default right there. Um, and in those, in that configuration file, I can use a, a number of very various event tags. So you know the typical things you'd see like is is not, contains, excludes, begins with, ends with, less than, more than, image. So you can be very specific if you're looking for um, EXEs and using, you want to use, you know, sort of like um, you, you want to, you want to basically be very specific as to what you're looking for. You can specify that using these event tags. So good example, like include only Google Chrome network activity, as I showed you before. Network Connect on match includes image condition contains Chrome.exe. Include thread, thread injections into win logon and LSAS if you're looking for pass the hash. You know, create remote thread on match include, and you're only looking for Im target images of LSAS and win logon.exe. Uh, I, I want to see anything that isn't signed by Microsoft. Um, so I could do an image load on match exclude signature contain signature condition contains Microsoft. So anytime I find a uh, an image that's loaded that is signed by Microsoft, I'm going to exclude that. So this allows you to find all binaries that are executed that were not signed by Microsoft. Uh, and again, you know, you can also do event tags with no filters. So it means that on match has the opposite effect. So include won't log any images, excludes logs all images of that tag type. So for example, process create uh, because of on you know because of the on match exclude. So you can see here uh, by by basically uh, using no filters, I have the basically the opposite effect in that configuration. So a good example. This is one I typically set up is if you install the uh, Splunk universal, universal Forder on your server and you want to fire those uh, those uh, those uh, sysmon logs over to your Splunk uh, your Splunk server, um, some of the ones I typically exclude are uh, Splunk, Splunk, and and B tool because they create a lot of noise and a lot of useless um, useless uh, log data. So right off the bat. Anytime I have a server that I'm going to install the the universal forwarder on, I'm automatically going to exclude those. So you can see here a process when a process is created uh, on match, I want to exclude um, 
anything uh, from a parent image perspective that includes this, right? Other configuration entries, you can you could set an archive directory uh, where you have copy on delete files are moved, uh, check revocation, uh, copy on delete PE, which preserves the deleted executable image files, uh, DNS lookup, so controls reverse DNS, driver name, uh, hash algorithm, and so on. These are all configuration uh, items that are kind of global configuration items as opposed to specific rules are gonna set up in the system. So a couple other good examples, you can see your uh, event ID three, network connection initiated, network connect on match includes. So any condition, uh, any image that begins with C program data. So I would look for that because essentially I sh shouldn't have uh, binaries that are executing network communications from the program data directory. That's not typical, right? They should be sourced from the program files directory. So if an attacker has installed some kind of some kind of command and control um, beacon in there and it starts to beacon out, it shouldn't be doing that from the program data directory. That's that would mean that it isn't something that is legitimate, right? Image condition begin with C Windows temp. So anything that is communicating from the system level temp directory uh, may seem a bit suspicious as well. Yes, the recording will be available for those who are asking. Um, file created a uh, system sys event, uh, sysmon event ID 11. So include anything with an SCR, VBS or HTA. Um, so again, anytime that you're dealing with phishing files, for example, um, and uh, you're creating files on the system, I want to understand when any of these uh, cre files are created with these, these uh, extensions. So just another basic config. So I just put a, provided a really quick example. You could see here, this is a full uh, config file. I have over a couple pages, but I'm specifying the, the hash algorithm, SHA-256. Uh, and then I have event ID process created, I have an exclude. So I'm excluding uh, any processes that are fitting these image conditions. So if the image is this, chrome.exe, I won't log. Um, if it's Google update, I won't log. If it's Google update, I won't log. If, um, if it's notepad.e, not notepad++, I won't log. If it's Adobe ARM, I won't log. And under system 32, same thing, search filter host, search protocol host and, and audio DG. Um, event ID, ID two, um, I have an on match excludes. Uh, and then basically uh, event ID three, uh, for, you know, for example, let's say I'm, I want to exclude uh, I want to exclude anything going to Akamai, right? So I might exclude that, or, or maybe I'm excluding a whole bunch of IPv6 I, I, IPs, uh, excluding things like 224.00.251. You know, you can basically, uh, you know, exclude anything with a destination or a source IP um, that will that just creates uh, details that you really don't need to track. Process terminates, event ID five, uh, process terminate on match excludes. So anytime background host, background task host.exe terminates, I'm not going to log it. Anytime task host, host w.exe uh, ends, I'm not going to log it and so on and so forth. Uh, image load on match, uh, only collect false sign image modules, true. So if it's a sign condition of true, I'm going to exclude. I only want to get the... Um, the uh, binaries that are loaded that are not signed. So I'm gonna exclude the ones that aren't. Uh, I'm also gonna exclude things like uh, shell extension x64.dll, 7zip.dll, Chrome, uh, Google updates, uh, search filter host, blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera. Lastly, event 11 file create. Um, basically, I'm gonna include anytime these, are, these files are created and so on and so forth. Uh, DNS, I'm going to exclude any time you go to Microsoft.com. 
So you can see how the configuration file is like our best friend here in terms of building something where we can include and exclude um, and, and build a configuration file that doesn't put us in this scenario of a needle and a stack of needles, right? So as I mentioned, you can build your own, but you can also uh, you can also download them. So the two, and these were mentioned in the comments, the two big ones that you can download, um, there's one called uh, from a person called Swift on Security. If you don't follow Swift on Security on Twitter, you should. Uh, the the comparison to Taylor Swift is just fabulous. So it's really worth following on Swift on Security. So what, uh, what this person has done is they've basically taken the attack framework and they've turned it into a configuration file. You got the chat here. Swift's amazing. Yeah, Swift is amazing. So they've actually taken the configuration file and they've applied uh, the attack framework to it. So all of the behaviors that are in the attack framework are actually in Swift on Security's sysmon config file. So remember I said we should be looking for things that are reflective of TTPs? Well, they've done that in this config file and it's free. You go to github.com. So Swift on Security's GitHub, GitHub under sysmon config and you can download the XML file. Uh, I only give a, this is like one, I mean, the XML file is huge. It's pages and pages and pages. It's really big and it's so well documented. So as you can see here, this is a, a, a snippet of it. He has under Sysmon event ID three network configuration connection initiated. And then they, they comment everything. So everywhere the place, well, here's, look, here's a reference to first. Here's a reference to a paper back from 2017. So anytime that this person goes and uh, puts in a, a, um, a configuration, in, um, they go and they basically uh, put a comment in. So for example, I want to include image condition at.exe. So, and it says here, Microsoft Windows remote task scheduling removed, removed in Windows 10. So, and then they give credit to whoever provided that that item to include in the config file. So it's it's a really good config file. It's very, very, uh, very complete. Got another question here. Their documentation, the config file should be in a webinar on, on documentation itself. Yes, it should be. Um, so for example, there, you know, network traffic source from program data or Windows temp or network connections using netcat, nc.exe. You could see that here, right? So they're basically saying like uh, anything that is beginning with Windows temp or program data that should be logged. The other one that's really good is Olaf Hartong's. Uh, so his is very similar to Swift on security. So it's based on the attack framework. The only difference is Swift on security is like one big config of everything. Um, Olaf's config is broken up into modules. So you don't have to necessarily install everything. You can install portions of it. Um, it's a little bit more modular, uh, but still mapped to the attack framework. So again, if you wanna use these, you just download them from GitHub and use that minus C for configuration and you reference them and, and away you go. So it is important to note that there were issues with um, Sysmon version 13. Um, being 100% compatible with uh, with this uh, with Olag's sorry Olaf's um, config file, um, so that might be an issue, right? So this question comes up a lot too. Should I deploy to everything? Should I put it everywhere? Uh, well, it's this is a good question. Um, most people I talk to will restrict Sysmon only to key servers just because, not because of the amount, I mean, it's easy to deploy. It's just the amount of data that they're gonna to have to analyze and consume. Uh, but there really is no reason why you can't deploy it to a workstation. Um, you know, I would, I would ensure that you have a pared down configuration to limit the data and then go with like a GPO or SCCM to deploy it, but it's fairly easy. I had a client uh, most recently that um, has deployed it to all of their workstations. And it's great. I mean, it works great, um, but you got to be very careful in the amount of uh, the, the configuration file. And it's not because you can't generate that data, but it's what are you going to do with it afterwards, right? 
Uh, who here, uh, who on the call uh, is actually deploying it to work, workstations and servers? Yeah, unless you're an MSSP and you want to charge more. <laughs> So we have one person that said, yes, they are running it uh, in, uh, they are running it in, uh, they're running workstations. Okay, you are a private bank. Yeah, like the company that I know that I was, that was running it on a workstation was a utility, a pr uh, power utility. Um, so uh, this worked out really well. And it's, and it's great. Like if you're, if you are working with, um, if you are working with ICS or OT systems, and you're, you know, like, let's say you're running a SCADA system by, I don't know, Siemens or, or uh, Schneider, and it's running on a Windows machine, like running Windows 7 or something, and you can't install any agents or any antivirus or anything. Well, you most, be, because it's using the, um, the event logging facility, you most probably can install Sysmon and still be, you know, still be good with it. Um, so it's, it's really good in those cases to, you uh, to be able to build uh, config files that are specific to that SCADA workstation. I've done it many times and it's it's saved me from not being able to do anything on a SCADA workstation, uh, being able to run this, right? Legacy OT systems, yeah, yeah, exactly. So that's what I'm saying. Like I've been on, and and like the only problem sometimes, like I keep uh, I keep an archive of all the old versions of Sysmon. Sometimes they're a little bit tricky to find. So if you're trying to deploy in like a Windows XP machine, uh, shame, 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 but it exists. Uh, you, in a lot of cases, you can't use the newer version of Sysmon. So you have to have the old versions. So I tend to keep an archive of all the versions. That way I, I can run which one is uh, available. Now, again, by doing that, you might not have all the options because um, those options may not be available in the older versions. But I could tell you, for example, I just deployed Sysmon on a set of um, uh, DCS systems uh, running a uh, running a turbine, a gas turbine. And uh, the cool thing was those DCS systems, they never they never go to the internet. They don't I don't even think they had access to the internet. But if you have malware that gets installed on it, the malware may try to beak it out and call home. So I basically was running the DNS and all the network stuff. And uh, when we tested, it was great because I could say, hey, look, this, this machine is trying to go out to the internet. Even if it can't go to the internet, I still wanna know that it's trying. So we're able to isolate any, any issues where malware gets installed on a system um, and then tries to beacon out to the internet. Um, and these these DCS workstations running uh, running XP had no had no antivirus, no agents, nothing running on them except Sysmon. So it's a it's a really good cool, really good tool when it comes to that. Yeah, if GPO and SCCM are not an option, Ansible obviously Ansible is very easy. Um, um, as well as uh, you can use, I've I've actually used um, uh, Puppet and Chef to do it to do deployments as well. So. There's a number of ways you can get this on your workstation. Hell, you can even use a PowerShell script if you want to manually do it. So there's definitely different options. So really quick, I'm going to show you a quick case study, and then we're going to talk about use cases. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, Osiris ransomware, uh, really bad one. Um, what I want to do is I want to walk through this uh, case that basically follows uh, Osiris from initial infection all the way to uh, sorry, for initial drop all the way to infection and encryption. And we're gonna do that solely from, uh, from an, a Sysmon perspective. So uh, if you're not familiar with Osiris, part of the Lockheed family, it's a fairly old piece of ransomware, uh, but this uh, case study is really, really good. I wanted to show it to you. It invades the system using spam technique or exploiting uh, detected system vulnerabilities. Um, the dropper is a JS file that drops uh, into Osiris, uh, drops the Osiris ransomware onto the machine. There's also a bunch of command and control stuff. Now the version I'm using, the, the case study is actually using an older version of Sysmon. So some of the options like DNS, uh, I don't believe were in this version. So, but it's a, it's a really good case study. So um, as we can see here, the initial running of the malware from the desktop, 
which is typical since it's designed to be double clicked by user after download. So we can see here, we have a we have a um, an, um, an event ID one pr process create. So you can see if you scroll, if you look down, you have the command line, C Windows System 32 W script.exe. And then we have uh, it running a JS file off of the desktop, the IE user desktop uh, in, in that current directory, right? So that's the first thing to notice. We have our first process create of a .js file. So that's our, that's our dropper basically being executed, right? Second thing we have here is we can follow through the logs by using the process GUID. Remember I mentioned this earlier, the process GUID is gonna allow us to follow the process as it's mutating and, and executing throughout the throughout this campaign, right? So uh, we could follow the logs using the process GUID. So we could see here that the process GUID and we could see here the that W script um, and we could see here that some files were dropped into a temp folder. Now, again, following that same process GUID, we could see that there is command and control. So network is turned on. We could see here that um, destination of w, or VXHCF-31 uh, dot SRV dot cat on port 80, uh, use, uh, so, so HTTP. So we could see that essentially, um, in this case, uh, a non-browser made an HTTP connection to something on the outside of the, on the internet. So again, and we could follow that from the process GUID. So we had the dropper execute, we had some files uh, that were copied into a directory. Then we have our first uh, command and control communication to the internet uh, using something other than a browser. So uh, command and control is contacted probably for second stage executable. Uh, since the JS file is typically just a dropper. So you could see here, following that same process GUID, uh, we can see here that we have a target file name of uh, that .zk file that was created. Uh, the file uh, gpt3ly2w whatever whatever is run um, using run dll32. You can see that in the command line. Um, and it, again, we're still following that process good. But in this case, now, because we've executed a new uh, a new exe using run dll32, we now have a new process GUID. So now we have to make sure we're we're watching that new process GUID because it is considered a child office parent. Uh, we also noticed, for example, the main encryption binary in, in dll form as well. Uh, at this point, a new command and control domain is contacted uh, using, again, following that child process GUID. We could see another destination IP. Um, and this is where the keys are being transferred for encryption. Uh, and then finally, what we have is we have a file created in the desktop. Osi we have a file created under the desktop called osiris79f4.htmm. HTM, and this is most probably the the screen that pops up saying, you know, you've been, you've basically been encrypted, right? So you, as you can see by using something as simple as the process GUID in Sysmon, we can actually track specifically what's been happening in this, in this OSIRIS ransomware infection from beginning dropper all the way to encryption, right? Any questions this far? I think we're still good. When you or your IR customer haven't done your Sysmon homework in time, you can always do tactical deployment using a Velociraptor. However, better to pre-install. Yes, you can use Velociraptor, but you can also you can also deploy using another other methods um, with updated config files as well. So. Uh, which I've done many, many times. I've gone in and said, you know, let's put Sysmon on these servers right away. And I typically, they'll say, oh, we have five servers. I can even power, I can even PS exec them right down uh, really quickly. Like I said, it's such a, it's such a, a comprehensive tool, but it's so light that it's so easy to use and deploy, right? So uh, the bigger picture here, well, it's great that we can get all this great Intel from Windows. What happens when you have numerous Windows machines on the premise in the cloud 
let's look at some use cases that infect the entire enterprise. So bringing this into your SIM, pretty much anything, any SIM out there, any major SIM uh, today, log management solution, they pretty much all support um, support Sysmon um, as a native log source. So I remember in the old days when I used to use ArcSight, we used to have to create what they call flex connectors, or uh, we used to, have to create our own connectors uh, for you know these various log sources. Now in this case, in ArcSight's case, there's a flex connector for it, just like there's a content extension in QRadar, uh, a Splunk add-on in Splunk, um, there is uh, um, uh, support for WinLogBeat uh, in Greylog with Sysmon. Elastic supports it in a module. So no matter pretty much almost every SIM product out there uh, will support uh, Sys uh, Sysmon in there, uh, which is great. Um, so you don't have to worry about, you know, uh, doing anything where you have to define uh, define this as a, a separate log source and figure out all the fields and so on. Um, and this is most most probably because Sysmon is so close to uh, EVTs and EVTs have, are you know typically supported by everybody. So you know you don't really have to worry about that. Uh, here's an example of Greylog. You could see uh, Greylog ingesting all the data for Sysmon uh, programs, DNS lookups, and so on and so forth. Uh, here it is in QRadar. Uh, as you can see, all all your uh, your event names coming in from from uh, Sysmon. Uh, Microsoft Sentinel uh, obviously is going to support this. So if you're doing uh, Sentinel in the cloud, supporting your Azure environment, uh, and you have servers in your Azure environment, you can definitely ingest it into uh, Microsoft Sentinel. Uh, a Linux oddity is a valuable piece of work, but I wish something like Sysmon exists for Linux in general. Yeah, you know, I mean, I agree with Linux. Uh, the only difference is micro, like, I find I can, I can do a lot more, I can understand a lot more with a Linux log than I can with a native event log in Windows. So, but yeah, I agree with you on that one. Sysmon for Linux is coming. Yes, it is. Actually, it's true. That's right, Marcus, it is. Uh, you can run it in Elk Stack as well. So if you're if you're running uh, Elk Stack or you're running uh, Security Onion or one of those tools, it will support that as well. So I'm going to show you examples in Splunk. Now, again, I'm not saying Splunk is better than anything else. Uh, it has its pros and cons. I'm just using Splunk because I'm using Splunk. So don't read anything into Splunk that I'm saying it's um, Sysmon is amazing. Splunk is just a sim. So. Um, so in the case of Splunk, um, you, in this case, installing a universal forwarder on your Windows server that you want to collect logs for um, and uh, ensuring you're collecting the right logs. And then uh, basically there is a Splunk add-on that you download from the App Store. Uh, and then you basically install it and you're able to ingest um, Sysmon logs into Splunk. Uh, and then the only other thing is you, obviously, if, if you've never done this before, You've got to enable your your uh, your receipt of data from your from your forwarder, uh, and then basically all you do is you go and you select your Splunk add-on and you install it. it. Takes a few seconds, and then you're able to do Splunk. Uh, as I did mention earlier, one of the things you want to do is ensure when you're ingesting from a Splunk forwarder that you uh, put your exclusions in so that you're not including a whole bunch of Splunk stuff in your uh, in your logs because this if you've ever looked at this it creates a ton of log files like sp the Splunk processes are always running because they're constantly forwarding data to the from the universal forwarder back to the Splunk head right so make sure you add this or it's going to create a lot of useless garbage uh, data that you don't really need. All right, so use cases. Obviously, this is really key, and and I I've I've worked at so many places, like I said earlier, where security operation centers they focus on collecting data and not understanding what they're going to do with it. So they they bring in all this data into their sim, and then they're then they try to figure out 
well, what do we do with this? And then they try to create, they create all kinds of use cases of things that really bring no value. So really what you want to do is you want to map your use cases to the logs to waste monitoring cycles. So, uh, you know, no use case equals wasted storage and money, right? So sit back, really go into whiteboard and figure out exactly what you want to monitor and then figure out what your data source is going to look like, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to map our use cases back to uh, a MITRE attack technique. So uh, again, just to reiterate what that is, uh, it, we'll see what the tactic is. Uh, we'll, no, we'll note what the uh, MITRE attack ID is and then the data source. So I'm going to, I'm going to use these throughout our, all of the use cases we're going to show you. Uh, and I'm going to show you use cases that are uh, around uh, malware investigation, command and control, use of PowerShell, uh, DNS threat hunting, credential access, persistence techniques. And the other thing I'm going to use at certain times is I'm going to use a backdrop of a case study. So uh, if you're familiar with RIAC, uh, I hate to deal with this ad nauseum and doing incident response. Um, so this is based on the UHS hospital breach that happened in October of 2020. Uh, the attack took 29 hours from the opening of the email to the shutdown of the organization uh, across the organization wide. The ransom was uh, 600 bitcoins or about 6 million to decrypt all the UHS systems. Impacted 400 locations, took three weeks to get all the systems back online. Um, and it locked medical staff out of a lot of systems and they had to use paper records. So I'm gonna use this as a backdrop, some of the items that, or some of the things that happened and where we could use syslog, sysmon to identify those processes as part of this breach that occurred. So the first one is, um, now I'm gonna just, given we have a, about an hour left, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you the screenshots as opposed to going to Splunk, unless people really wanna see Splunk because uh, it'll just save some time. Um, but the first one here is around DNS tra traffic identification. So the hypothesis is that adversaries may communicate uh, using application layer protocols to, to avoid detection uh, and try to uh, blend in with existing traffic. So we know this is very common, you know, um, attackers tend to use port 80, port 443, uh, a lot of DNS traffic. Um, and what they're trying to do is, is kind of hide um, the potential for command and control or any kind of uh, um, reverse shells, backdoors, that kind of thing, right? Um, so essentially what we want to do is we want to basically look to see if we can identify any of that DNS traffic, right? So when you look at DNS under Sysmon, um, uh, basically there's kind of two things to look at. You can see on uh, the, uh, the left side, I have a I have like a kind of sort of legitimate event. So I've got I've got Chrome here that's executing uh, querying a evil hacking site was 001.com, right? So you can see here that uh, I've logged that as event 22, a DNS event uh, that Chrome is going to that site, right? Now on the other hand, I have um, on event three, I also have uh, basically you can see the image here. I got a network connection detected and the image is putty.exe, okay? And it's connecting using SSH to an Amazon, uh, to an Amazon uh, AWS um, host. So you can see here, even though we're talking about event 22, this is really DNS traffic can go both. You could look at it through both sides, right? Yes, I could look at it through, um, uh, event 22 logs, but I can also look at it if networking is turned on. I can look at it through event three logs uh, in pulling the destination host name uh, field or destination IP out of there, right? So like right here, if I see somebody using PuTTY uh, or I see anything under port, uh, port SSH from a server that, that typically would be doing that, that might seem like something out of, out of, the, or, out of the ordinary. So you know, it allows me to look for applications or processes accessing the internet. But let's say I don't want to look for something uh, as common as Chrome. Let's say I'm not, I, I want to find all of the access uh, to the internet, maybe on port 80, uh, but I don't want to, I want to basically single out anything that's Chrome. 
Um, so if I'm looking at a workstation, for example, any traffic over port 80 or 443 that's going to the internet that is not through Chrome because that's typical, I want to log. So if I look at that from a Splunk perspective, I've got uh, my source, which is my, my operational, my sysmon log. And then I'm saying image is not equal to C program files, Google Chrome application, Chrome.exe. And then I'm displaying it in a table. So what this is going to do is it's going to basically show me all of my network traffic, right? That uh, basically is, uh, is not, uh, or it's going to show me all of my events that have network data that are not related to Chrome. So when you look at it in Splunk, you could see here, I have a whole bunch of destination IP, destination host name um, and ports, right? Um, and I have all the images and none of these images are Chrome. So what I can do with this data is I can actually sort by destination port and I can look for anything that is 443 or 80 um, because it, it may not be normal. There's no, I'm, I'm excluding a browser, right? So anything 443 or 80 in this case might be suspect. And you can see here, I've got, for example, a destination host name of win 2012 R2 uh, uh, on 192.168.10.129 on 443. And what's executing it? Well, nc.exe, which could possibly be netcat, right? So if I dig that a little bit deeper, I may also have things where I can utilize, for example, some, some IO, IOCs here. In the case of I'm running Chrome, I have an event 22, and Chrome is visiting tarasco.org. Tarasco.org is where we download Netcat, right? So in this case, if I correlate that with um, the basically, if I correlate that based on time, I can see that not only was uh, did somebody go to tarasco.com, but they actually downloaded pwdump7.exe. So I can see here in these cases by, by correlating um, my DNS with an event that occurred right after, in this case, a file stream created, I can see here that uh, essentially pwdump, um, pwdump was downloaded from that website. Um, and then essentially, I can basically go and search for that by uh, hash. So because I'm provided the hash, if I want to see where the attacker, if, I, if I've logged that they've downloaded PW dump on one system, well, now I want to see, did that attacker get that on any other system? Well, from that, I could take the hash and I could search across all of my systems for that hash. And in this case, it came up, you know, four or five times in the same system. So this allows me to basically look for, A, uh, I had a download that was suspicious. Uh, it ended up being PW dump. Uh, and now I'm curious if it's widespread on my network. So I'm going to search across my network by hash for that specific um, executable. Uh, and that brings me to our to back to Ryak as a use case. So we knew on day one of Ryak, at 4.37, actions began via loader malware known as Bizarre or ke ke Keg Tab. So what happened was um, the attackers downloaded and ran a file called document-preview.exe, and that file basically connected to uh, this IP over 443. So as we know, 443 is, a again, another common browser port, right? Um, it's, you know, our browser is going to connect to it to go do banking or whatever. Now, in this case, if I basically did a search on my systems and I uh, basically I eliminated or I excluded in my search uh, Chrome, um, Firefox, Safari, Internet Explorer um, and um, uh, an edge. If I excluded all those browsers and then I ran the query on show me every every other connection to uh, 443 that isn't from one of those uh, browsers, then I could have potentially identified that document preview went out to a site on port 443, right? So again, this is, a lot of this comes from behavior. So this is what the attacker is gonna do. Um, and then basically process of elimination, right?
got a question here. Oh, uh, somebody posted syslog for Linux is coming in theory. Yes. Um, so another one is PowerShell execution. So obviously PowerShell scripting language uh, included with Windows that's used by administrators, but it's also used by bad people as well. So execution of PowerShell scripts in most Windows versions is opaque and not typically secured by any virus, which makes using PowerShell easy way to circumvent security measures. So the whole possibility of fileless malware, you know, this is this is the the next generation thing that's been happening, uh, because PowerShell it does not get necessarily caught by any virus. So PowerShell can be used to hide monitored uh, command line execution, such as NetUse, uh, SC Start, or PSExec. So how would we look for that? Well, if we look at it from a Sysmon perspective, under um, event number thirteen, event thirteen. We can see here that we have a target object and you can see here, this is an interesting one. So once you go and you basically accept the EULA uh, when you run PS exec, it basically writes that into a H key user uh, key uh, for PS exec. So we can see here that we know PS exec has actually been run uh, because the image PS exec in temp folder has actually gone and updated the H key user software system journals PS exec EULA accepted um, key in the in the registry. Another question here. Something just hit me. How would you manage Sysmon forward from notebooks when they're out in the corporate network? Uh, well, you know, if they're out of the obviously if they're out of the corporate network, there's ways of doing that. Uh, using your cloud, your cloud providers, the same way you would do, uh, you know, policies for your EDRs and stuff. There are some methods. If you drop me an email afterwards, I could show you some methods to do that. Uh, but you can do, you can collect your Sysmon, for example, in the cloud. So if you're running, uh, if you're doing your forwarding of your events, you could forward them into the cloud so that as long as your system's collected, connected to the internet, you could still be forwarding those, those logs um, into the cloud, right? Um, so with our PowerShell execution, you can see here, I've got a command line uh, temp psexec.exe, right? Uh, minus u test account. So I actually have a connection here to an internal host minus s command. Um, and you can see that the parent image of that was PowerShell. So PowerShell is actually executing this command line, this psexec command, right? The other thing we could tell is based on the terminal session, we can tell that it was um, connected to a terminal server. We can also confirm things from the hash as well as the destination IP that PS exec was actually connecting to. So this gives us a really good way of like, if, if you're just going by PowerShell alone, uh, that might not be enough to basically identify that PowerShell is being used for something that is not legitimate, but being able to log the command line and the hashes and the destination IP allows us to really understand that somebody's trying to uh, basically execute commands on a remote host. So how would we look at that in Splunk? Well, again, we source out our operational directory, our operational log, parent image of PowerShell. And then in this case, I'm gonna specify a command line of star PS exec star, and I'm gonna display it in a table. So what ends up coming out is something like this. You see the computer, the original file name, which was psexec, the parent image of PowerShell, and then the actual command line. So this allows us to display that PowerShell was basically executing psexec and all of the actual command line values that go with that. So I could tell exactly what psexec was trying to do at, the, at that given time. So again, it's great. This way we could say, look, off the right off the bat, you know, based on based on um, T1059.001, I basically want to identify any PowerShell that is trying to execute PS exec. And this will find it. As long as you're ingesting the data, this will find it. Abnormal PowerShell usage. 
So um, e executing with the hidden parameter like PowerShell uh, minus NOP dash W hidden, base64 encoding, so you obfuscating that, uh, ref referencing environmental variables or registry entries to get the code from. Um, so these are all things that attackers like to do to be able to hide what they're trying to do at any given time. So here's a good example. I have a PowerShell execution. So I have an event one and PowerShell, uh, I have a, so I have a PowerShell, uh, where is it here? Yeah, image of PowerShell and command line parameters of minus encoded and a whole bunch of encoded stuff. So I look at this and if you're not looking for this, you're just PowerShell and there it's encoded, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a uh, I'm going to do a Splunk query for anything that is image equals PowerShell, and then I'm going to basically look for anything in the command line that has minus encoded command. Okay, so I want to look for any PowerShell command where encoding is happening, and we can see it here. So we look in here and we see look, uh, we have a whole bunch of PowerShell commands, and a, and there's three of them here that are encoding their their pay, their payload their command line right so if i take that that uh, encoded or that encoded uh, string and i plop it into decode uh, decoded the base 60, base 64 i see the decode is ctemp nc.exe uh, minus ldp443 minus e command.exe so what that is is essentially running netcat with a reverse shell on port 443. So again, by going back to this, this was, we were able to find anything that had that hash and basically determine that that hash is uh, essentially a netcat process running in the background. Now, maybe after I figured that out, I wanna see, well, where is this actually run? I want to find out where Netcat is actually running on my machine, on my machine. So again, I'm going to basically do a quick uh, Splunk lookup. And I'm going to look for anything under ctempnc.exe because that's where the intelligence is telling me it's going to be. And I'm going to basically put the data in a table. So I could see here, again, I could see uh, three instances of Netcat. I can also see they're basically set up as a listener. Uh, with a reverse shell to provide command.exe when you log in. If I take that netcat uh, binary and I put the hash up that because I have the hash now, I put it up in uh, in um, uh, virus total that I can basically confirm that it is in fact netcat. Furthermore, we have the hash from Sysmon, so we could search for the hash for any ob obfuscated versions of it, right? So again, the same way I was able to look for NCEXE anywhere I wanted. Well, what if the person, what if the attacker, um, you know, is executing uh, PowerShell uh, and executing Netcat in encoded format, but Netcat is somewhere else in my system and it's not called NC.exe. How do I find that? Well, I have the hash. So I can go and search for it based on, on the imp hash. So you can see here, I'm actually able to find a lot more copies of it running because it's not, you know, it's not necessarily running as nc.exe. And I can find that based on the actual impasse of the process itself. Productivity apps, uh, launching command.exe or PowerShell. So this is another one we talked about earlier. Um, programs like uh, Office, you know, WinWord, uh, Excel, um, opening a document that's been weaponized and that basically launches the command.exe or PowerShell. You can see in my example here at uh, the parent command, a parent image, you can see it's WinWord, parent command line. So we can see WinWord open a file in C users, uh, LAB user, desktop bad.doc. And then essentially you can see it above the command line is command.exe and it's running calc. So we can see that as well. Um, another thing that we might want to look at is uh, registry. Registry, so reg.exe called from the command line. So somebody making registry modifications, typically when we make registry modifications, we're using something like regedit. 
um, uh, or we're, we're using other channels to call the registry API directly. Reg is command line and it's not as often used um, unless it's something that is scripted um, or something like malware, for example. So we can see here uh, under our parent command line, we can see C Windows System32 command.exe. And then the command line is reg add H key user software Microsoft Windows current version run ransomware and ctemp dharma.exe. So what's happening here is the command line's running reg and it's adding a um, it's adding a uh, a key to the uh, to the current version run um, part of the registry so that essentially the next time the machine is rebooted uh, that piece of malware will run. How do we look for that? Well, very similar. We, we look for parent image, C Windows System 32 command.exe, and we look for command line star reg star, um, which will basically pull up anytime the registry was edited uh, using the command line. So you can see here, uh, I can see a bunch of things. And because I have the full command line and because it was done at the command line, I can actually get everything. Reg, add, H key, H key, current user software, Microsoft Windows current version run, and you can see the key that was added, ctempdharma.exe. Very, very useful in the command line. I may have some host discovery commands. So for example, uh, if I wanna run PS exec or I wanna do any other commands that the attacker may feel are important um, and are contained in Windows, maybe I wanna look for those. So a good example is who am I, right? Uh, who am I is a standard ex executable that you may find on any version of Windows. It provides the current user on your computer, including your login name, uh, groups you belong to, and privileges. It's not very common for the average user to run it, um, and it's used by sysadmins, et cetera. This, the pattern may serve uh, more as a hunting lead than a standalone detection. So you can see here I have a host discovery list. What I've done is I've listed a bunch of commands that, um, that are not you know, commonly used by the end user, host name, net, uh, IP config, um, SCDEXE, and so on and so forth. Um, maybe one that you want to run on a workstation, for example. Um, and then when I run it, I could see here, hey, I got an uh, image of C Windows System 32, who am I? And you could see the parent image running from PowerShell. And this is essentially what it looks like in Splunk. Sorry, I didn't mean to stop sharing there. Apologies for that. So let's go back to Ryak. So Ryak on day one at eight, at 448, Windows tools such as NL test and Netgroup and utility ad find, uh, AD find recon were run. So these three tools, NL test gets a list of domain controllers, queries the status of a domain trust, that kind of thing. Um, Netgroup adds, displays, or modifies global groups or in domains. And AD, AD find recon basically is a query tool to query the Active Directory, right? So knowing this, we could incorporate these TTPs. We could say here, XML win event log, Microsoft Windows Sysmon operational image equals add find or image equals net or image equals net uh, NL test in table format. So you could see here, I'm running it and you could see those suspicious commands that have come up, those net commands, right? Any questions thus far in the uh, use cases? You can see how flexible this is. I mean, and I'm just scratching the surface. I mean, there's a lot more you can do with it, um, but uh, it provides for great use cases. And like I said, uh, consuming, it, consuming it in the SIM makes it even, even easier. So what about processes spawning command.exe? So, 
Uh, again, um, any commands that will will spawn will spawn things like a direct directory listing, a copy, a make make directory, and so on and so forth. So what we would do here is basically we would display command.exe and we would list all of the original file name and command line uh, command line uh, parameters to pull that out. So you can see here we've got a whole bunch of uh, Explorer spawning um, spawning uh, command.exe. Here was another one. We talked about this one early on when we talked about um, uh, uh, Petya. Remember Petya was going to clear our event logs? Well, what about if we're alerting, looking, we're looking for that, looking for traces of event log clearing of uh, an attacker clearing up their tracks? Well, in Sysmon, uh, just to show you the, the difference, in Sysmon, it's event four, and in, in, uh, in event logs, it's event 1102, right? So basically, you can see here, uh, I have an 1102 event. This is just from Windows, uh, Windows, Sys Windows event log. So I, I'm able to determine if, uh, if my basically my logs have been cleared, right? And here you can see it again in, in, uh, in Splunk. So I'm doing a Sysmon operational event code four. And I'm determining that uh, these two these two uh, systems had their event logs cleared. Here's another really really fun one. This one is uh, referred to by attack as impairing de defenses. So this is basically being able to disable things like Windows Defender and the Windows Firewall to uh, bring down the bring down the defenses of the of the victim. So in the event Windows Defender Windows Firewall is turned off. Administrators should correct the issue immediately to prevent possibility of infection, right? So I can see that. So like, for example, I look at event code five, which is process terminated. And then I do a search for C program data, Microsoft Windows, Defender, Platform, MS, MS, MSMP, ENG, .exe. And if I see that, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty bad. So the great thing is like, if I look at RIAC, for example, this was something they did. Ryak on day two at 2143, they used an encoded PowerShell to disable the Windows Defender. So they basically took, they used their PowerShell with the encoded command. Um, and when you basically look up that encoded uh, command in a base 64 decoder, you can see here at the bottom, it has their PowerShell 127001 set, set MP preference disable real-time monitoring is true. So if I'm looking for that, I should be able to find out if people are disabling my Windows Defender, right? RDP connections is another one that's uh, fairly interesting. Uh, so anytime people are connecting to your systems via RDP, uh, this is especially a big issue if you're um, allowing uh, external access to an RDP system, which I don't think is a good idea. So in this case, I'm looking for an event ID three. I'm focusing on port 3389, which is um, which is RDP, and I'm basically looking for an image of SVC host.exe because that's what uh, forks off um, the RDP session. So again, we look at it from a Splunk perspective. We can see here we have a source and destination. Uh, we have the parent uh, image, which is SVC host, and we have the destination port of 3389. So that allows us to tell whether or not somebody's laterally moved to another system using RDP at the end of the day. Credential, credential dumping via Mimikatz, right? So there's we can also do this with, uh, with um, Sysmon as well. So the things we know about Mimikatz is there's process injection. We inject a DLL into the LSAS process and start, a, or start up a thread. Uh, we allow Mimikatz to access and do what LSAS can. And uh, standard EVT does not log this, would, would not log that process injection, but Sysmon does. So you can see here in the, uh, in the example I've provided, um, you can see here that uh, we have that LSAS process um, further down that target image. And so when we look at this in Splunk, we can see the first thing 
Uh, now I'm just using event code 4658, uh, or uh, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm eliminating event code 4658, 4689, but I'm looking up event code 10. So by looking up event code 10, I can tell that Mimi Cats basically, uh, Mimi Cats has shown up here as a source image, and basically its target is LSAS.exe. And then if I traced it some more, I could also see all of the different images loaded. So these are all the DLLs that Mimi Cats needs its functions from. So right here, I could see all of those various um, uh, various DLLs. Now, if you were really concerned about Mimi Cats, you could potentially create a use case to search your machines to see if those images are ever loaded, if you ever needed to. Uh, and then we might have to track the events of an entire session. So Sysmon includes that a session GUI, which is also really cool. Um, and and uh, so you can see here uh, at the bottom, this logon GUI or logon GUID, I, can, I have it here. So I have this interesting event using the net.exe command. I have the logon GUID. Um, so what I do here is I do a search for that logon GUID in Splunk and display everything that is associated. By doing that, I I could see now a whole bunch of things that are happening. I could see Putty was used. I could see uh, I could see Putty was installed. I can see Chrome. I can see Command.exe and so on and so forth. So by doing that, by following that that logon GUI, I'm able to actually follow uh, all the things that happened during that login session, right? As you can see, when we look at trending of that specific uh, logon GUID process, you can see we can tell over a period of time that that user has been very busy doing a bunch of things that they probably shouldn't have. Any questions on use cases? I'll take questions at the end. We're we're almost through this. We're almost through the section. I'll, we can. Uh, we'll we'll take questions on those use cases towards the end. So th really, really quickly, um, you know, alerts, reporting, and dashboards. I would recommend, you know, uh, it's this the session's not about standing up a sock, but your data visualization is key. You know, adding alerts and so on is is really important. I just wanted to show you this is um, uh, basically a this Sysmon Olag created a Sysmon uh, application you can install very much like you're installing uh, the, the Sysmon support in, um, in Splunk. And this app basically provides all of the queries for you out of the box. So for example, you could see your login GUIs. I could type in uh, Jack and I could search for Jack, uh, all the things that have happened with Jack in the past 24 hours, all the processes that person has executed. Um, and this, these queries are all built into the app. You don't have to do anything. Um, I can basically show the network connections over time and from where they came from. And then lastly, I can get an information like the event count over time, the breakdown of events. So I could tell, for example, you know, most of the events we had were process create over other things in the, in the network, right? So in wrapping this up, a couple things to show you. Um, so this was mentioned earlier. Uh, the there's the Sysmon community guide, which is a really, really good guide that has a lot of good information on running Sysmon in your environment. Uh, there's also the Sysmon defer. Uh, so M Haggis has a really good site that has a lots and lots of really good um, Sysmon information. Uh, Chris on security also has a good one on integrating um, Azure Sentinel with Sysmon. Really, really good to be able to monitor your servers in your Azure environment with with um, with Sysmon. Uh, there's the Sysmon config, a configuration file for everybody to fork. That's the Swift on security one, uh, which is really good. And uh, I did mention it earlier, but there's the OLAG one as well. And lastly, if you're going to get any book to monitor your endpoint, to really understand what's going on in the endpoint, these are the two books I recommend. Uh, the Windows Internal 1 and 2. They're uh, version 7. Uh, there's updates coming up for these, but these are the best books to understand things like just the the um, how Windows actually works by 
how its process processes work and so on. They're really, really good books. So in closing, uh, you know, Sysmon is an important part of your arsenal. Uh, don't undervalue the importance of Sysmon. Give it it's just a Windows log and it's not like that multi-million dollar CrowdStrike or Silence or Carbon Black deployment. Just because it's an event log, it doesn't mean you can't do some marvelous things with it. And as I showed you with the, the um, use cases, there's lots and lots of really good options. Um, and a lot of things you could do much easier than, than deploying any, um, any kind of uh, EDR tool, right? Um, the, the tool is as close to native as EVT logs. So it doesn't require a complex agent to be installed and maintains a high level of fidelity. Also does not require a reboot at any given time. Configurations, experiment with your configurations. Like I said, I have a server full of configurations of different things. I also have a, a bunch of different versions of Sysmon. So, you know, play around with them, right? Customize Swift on security's config file. You may have a configuration for workstations versus servers versus DMZ versus internal database server. It could be very different as you move along those different systems. Uh, Sim visibility, whether it's Splunk, Raylog, or another Sim or log management tool, it's great. To, it's a great idea to use your Sysmon data as part of your uh, use cases um, to ensure that you so ensure you're ingesting those into your uh, Sim. And then finally, you know, it's good to good to inform your people that it is not a replacement for your EVT logs. Uh, the administrators who use those EVT logs will not lose them. Uh, Sysmon provides more, more than enough information uh, than standard uh, default Windows uh, logs provide. Uh, you never know, your sysadmins may say, well, we're not going to use an EVT anymore. We're just going to use Sysmon, right? So with that, I provide you my, my information and I want to open it up for questions. Um, let's see what we got here. Uh, just some Twitter stuff. No, it's just Twitter stuff so far. What if I rename uh, psexec.exe to something else? Okay, so I'll, I'll let you guys answer that. The question is, what if I rename psexec to something else like word.exe? How am I going to determine that it's psexec and not, oops, and not word.exe? No takers, the hash. Yeah, somebody, uh, Ferrari has just posted the hash. Yeah, so if if I took PS exec and I renamed it to word.exe and then I went and launched that, or let's say I, 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 I created some other file, let's say I created a, a, you know, a script or something and made it look legitimate and used, and used uh, PowerShell to launch it. Uh, now the fact that I have the, the hash um, I can basically use that hash to determine that it's PS exec. So that don't don't to minimize the the value of the hash. Um, Nicholas has a question on log collection advice. What what specifically are you looking for, Nicholas? How to collect? Uh, yeah, so NX log, uh, like I said, uh, if you it depends on where you're where you're putting your logs. Any specific uh, uh, log management or or sim that you're using, Nicholas, to collect that you collect your logs from? Uh, just while we're waiting for Nicholas to respond. Uh, Aleta, Alita or Aleta has a question with regarding uh, automatic uh, a delayed start. Uh, well, what you miss with the delayed start is um, potentially a kernel-based malware. Anything that's going to start up early in the process, you might miss out on that. Uh, what do we got here? Splunk and Greylog. So, um, so uh, WinLogBeat for Greylog and Splunk, you can use the uh, Splunk uh, Universal Forwarder. 
Uh, you can also use NX log. You can use uh, WEF. Uh, there's a number of ways you can get it. I mean, it's no different than event logs. The same way you would consume your event logs in uh, Splunk and Graylog, the same way you can consume uh, Sysmon, right? Uh, about a rename, can we trust file headers? Uh, so again, if you're not sure that a hash is going to provide enough, like you, you may do a hash and find out that somebody's tampered with the EXC and then that there's no data in um, virus total, you know, then you fall back to your attack framework to your actual behaviors, right? So there, there is always the possibility that somebody's built something and it does not have a hash, like it's not known to the community, right? Well, then you're falling back to your, your um, uh, to looking at your, your behaviors. So you have a, you have an executable that's run, um, you know, event ID one, and then you start to track it and it's doing weird things. So what you want to do is you want to basically build use cases. And then uh, eventually if that unknown binary that uh, doesn't have a known hash uh, does something, it'll fall into one of those use cases and you'll pick it up. So like, for example, if it's trying to do a port 443 connection uh, to an outside inter internet site, uh, but, it's, but it's not a browser, it's this weird process, you may capture it um, in that use case, right? So that's why I'm, I'm always very bullish about, um, about the attack framework, uh, because, it's, uh, because at the end of the day, uh, it's uh, it's gonna it's gonna be the, the the true decider at the end of the day of what's going on. Uh, WEC or specific agent for collection. Uh, I for Splunk, I would probably just use the uh, Windows Event Forwarder. Uh, yeah, that's probably what I would do. Let's see what else we got here. Pro tip, be a bit careful with new Sysmon versions. Some releases have included nasty bugs, memory leaks. Yes. Yeah, so what I typically do, and this is no different than any other software, um, is I, I'll wait. So what you're going to notice with, Sys, with Sysmon, it's no different. Uh, I'll show you this. We'll go back to this really quickly here. Uh, da, 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 where is it? Oh, where is it? Where is it? Here, this. So if you look closely at this, you know, I typically what I do is um, is I will wait. So like you see where you have like version 10 comes out. I usually don't install version 10 till at least 10.2 is out or 10.3. Because you notice every version that's released, there is always a subversion, and those versions are usually uh, regression bug fixes, or some kind of bug fix of some sort. So, like for example, I would install thirteen. Uh, I'll I'll probably start in thinking about installing thirteen in the in my environment um, in in the next little while because they've had two releases so far. So typically, that's what I would do. I would wait a couple releases to see if there's any major problems that are fixed. Uh, but that's a good good point to Marcus. I've, I've had that issue as well. Um, the other thing you may notice as well is major versions, um, Swift on security and OLAG, if you're using their configs, in some cases, they their configs, if there's been a, a schema change, so you notice these schema changes, sometimes these schema changes will break things in those configs. So you may deploy, you may have a custom built config that you built or you're using OLAG's config and then you try to deploy that config with an older, a newer version and it won't work. So same thing, um, the configs aren't necessarily backwards compatible either. So just be careful about that. Um, and like uh, Marcus says here, you know, uh, test carefully and, and let others find the bugs before installing. So I agree with that. Any other questions? Um, I, I, you know what, I, I'd appreciate guys if, uh, I'm going to just go to the, my contact info. Um, if you guys have any questions, please, please, please reach out to me. Um, I, I do run a practice for Grant Thorne, but I'm not a sales guy. I'm not, 
If you reach out to me and drop me an email, this is my personal information. You're not going to get a sales thing or anything like that. I, when I do present presentations for first, I present as myself. Um, and I don't want that to be uh, a detractor for someone not to reach out to me. I, I love uh, inc increasing my community. Uh, I'm pretty active on Twitter as well. So, um, you know, uh, whether it's Sysmon or other things, I post on my website different blogs and then they go on to Twitter. So, you know, if, I'd appreciate it if you follow me on Twitter. I'd love to keep connection with you uh, if you're a user of Twitter or if not, drop me an email. Like, keep keep the community going. Like, um, you know, especially when it comes to, to these kind of things, like, um, you know, I've, I've made some great connections at first and I, I, you know, some long, long, long line friends. So I'd like to keep that going, uh, going forward. So if anybody has any other questions uh, outside of this, like really feel free to reach out. I, you know, I know it's, we, 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 go, we did almost four hours. There's lots of things I didn't talk about. There's, there's lots of other use cases that I have. Um, if anybody's interested in um, Sysmon in an ICS OT environment, I could talk about that for hours on its own. Um, so that is my my area specialty. So feel free to reach out. I have done like Sysmon uh, deployments to detect things that we've seen in the wild from an ICS uh, target perspective. Um, so if you have any questions or you're interested, uh, drop me an email or find me on Twitter. Um, but um, Hopefully this has been useful to everyone, and I'm I'm thrilled that uh, so so many people were able to uh, so many people were able to stop by. So I guess I'll hand it back over to uh, to uh, Josh if he's got any closing comments. And uh, like I said, this is going to be recorded, and um, uh, the uh, slides will be available as well. Nothing for more from on my end. Uh, thank you, everyone. And that's a wrap. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks guys. And everybody, please do your do your do your best to stay safe, uh, because the the more we do that, the more we'll next we'll have a uh, a great session in person. And I'm looking forward. I'm really looking forward to uh, to uh, to seeing everybody in person at the next uh, um, live event. So stay safe and uh, take care, everyone.